you all for coming. I'm Sally Bagshaw with Seattle City Council, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight. But before I get to Dr. Um, Cooker, I would like to recognize some dignitaries that we have right here from our School of Public Health internationally. Um, and I just would like to have you recognized. Um, we have over here Dr. Richard Jackson, well, well known and, and known to many of us before we even got involved in the Greenway movement. Um, Andy Danneberg. Go oh, here, Andy. Um, and Brian Simmons up here. Um, Hank Weiss. Hank, thank you for being here. And Anne, help me with your last name. Bernay Moudon? Yes. Am, I, am I sort of close to that? Well, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. So let me tell you briefly, I met John on Saturday. So we're close personal friends because of, because of um, a project that nice. my good friend Eli <laughs> put together up in Vancouver last weekend. A number of us from City Council and from the Greenway Movement and two friends from Portland, Oregon, who have been instrumental in moving the Greenway's program forward in Portland, got together to go around Vancouver with some of the City of Vancouver engineers and some of their consultants on their rain gardens and their water quality just to see what Vancouver has accomplished. And in just five years, Vancouver didn't have any more infrastructure than much of what you've seen here in this city until they really got going. And I want to commend a number of you that have been working in this, um, Eli, Eli and Bob Edmiston, um, and many others, Dave, um, from the University of Washington, and back in the corner, we've got Josh, Josh Cavanaugh from the UW. These people have come together, and we together have looked at the city of Seattle, encouraged our Seattle Department of Transportation to move forward with neighborhood greenways and with connections through the city. Now, I got involved in this, frankly, after our, what I went to Portland and saw what Portland had done just two years ago, but also recognizing the important public health aspects of this movement, of moving people into alternatives besides feeling like the only way to get around is with your car. And John, he is an amazing man who has been doing this for decades. He's recently just written this book. He's the co-author of City Cycling. You'll learn more about that as you hear him speak. Um, he's one of the crazy kids that got out of the University of North, of North Carolina um, about, we decided, about four decades ago, same year as I got out. 1972. <laughs> and he had good enough grades to be able to go on to MIT, which, you know, at, at that time, the time of life and around the Vietnam War, that was a pretty impressive effort. John has really been focusing on bicycling with all ages and abilities, and that is something that personally is very important to me. As a woman, I, I have ridden my bike in the past 20 years, and I used to be a commuter. Um, as I've gotten a little older and don't bounce as well, um, I'm less likely to ride when there are cars around me. So I'm really focusing on having safe and separated bicycle facilities, whether that is a cycle track, whether it's a neighborhood greenway, whether it's a buffered bike lane, all the tools in the toolbox that we can look at, I'm interested in looking at. So John has written um, three books and 100 articles or more about cycling in the cities. He's gone around the world. You will hear from him about the facilities that he has seen um, in Northern Europe, um, Germany, Japan. So we'll, I'm going to get off the stage and give it to you, John. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Well, My first time as well. I mean, and let me tell you, we left those younger kids in the dust. <laughs> well, thank all, thanks to all of you. Or since actually I'm spending my sabbatical about you and Sajan, thanks to y'all for coming to this talk. I really, really do appreciate it. Um, there are a lot of people to thank uh, for uh, material for this whole event and for making the trip to Vancouver possible. Um, and one of the universities, we have to be here at the University of Washington, thanks to the University of Washington for letting us use this, use this facility. Uh, many thanks to the city of Seattle, which represented by Sally. Um, uh, and they do actually build the facilities for walking and talking, so they're really important. Um, and I especially wanted, I'm not sure if you've seen actually the draft um, uh, bike plan, uh, just came out. Uh, but one of the things I was really excited about is it officially sets as a goal uh, making cycling convenient, safe, uh, comfortable, uh, pleasant, 
uh, for all ages and for all ability. And so I really, really am very excited because one of my goals when I'm looking at urban transportation, whether it's mass transit or walking or cycling, the whole issue is of social justice is absolutely crucial, I think, um, and it should be crucial to the public policy when it comes to transportation of, of every city. Many thanks to Eli <laughs> and, and Kathy of uh, Seattle uh, Neighborhood Greenways, and I got to try them out yesterday for four hours. Uh, thanks to Robin uh, Randalls, with whom I'm uh, staying was the, before I moved over to the Temple Hotel. Uh, thank many thanks to the Cascade Bicycle Club, which also helped uh, set up this event uh, and came with us also to uh, Vancouver for our tour. Thanks to the Sierra Club, they've been big supporters of walking and cycling and mass transit, not just here in Seattle, but really throughout the United States, but been really, really very supportive. And she, John, holds the uh, sort of the West Coast head of uh, is the head of the transportation committee of the Sierra Club. And also thanks to Alta Planning, which has been setting up bike plans and bike sharing systems all over uh, North America. So lots and lots of groups um, to thank, which just, in a way, it makes a point. And that is, you can't do any of this by yourself. You have to form coalitions. You have to work with other groups. It's one of the points you get at the end of the lecture, too. Um, no group by itself is going to be have enough influence, enough information um, to, to implement the policies we need to get implemented. So we really need to form these coalitions, have environmental groups, uh, form coalitions with transportation, with public health groups. I can't tell you how important public health is. I mean, if you don't think it is, believe me. I think they're, in a way, our most important coalition partners. Okay, having said that, <laughs> I will now continue with this. Um, and that is, you might first ask the question, most of you probably wouldn't, but uh, I think we need to be able to answer the question, because we will be asked. Why is it worthwhile promoting walking and cycling? Why is it we should be building better walking and cycling facilities? Why should we be setting up a range of programs to encourage more walking and cycling? Well, it turns out there's lots of different answers. And some people might want to walk or cycle for certain reasons, and other people for other reasons, and that's fine. And that's a great thing, in a way, because the more reasons there are for promoting walking and cycling, the more groups are going to be willing to support it. So some people will support walking and cycling because they're very economical. It costs less for the individual to buy a pair of shoes, or unless you're going to buy a car, buy a bike, <laughs> buy a pretty reasonable bike for $300, $500, $600. You don't have to have a super duper bike. Um, but the, the operating costs are virtually nothing. It doesn't cost that much in the way of maintenance and so forth. Is a really important point also in terms of the economics of walking and cycling is it's also much cheaper for governments. It's cheaper for local governments, state governments, federal government, and so forth. Much, much, much cheaper to build walking and cycling facilities than it is to build the roadways, that's for sure. I mean, it's almost a, it's a ratio. I've looked at it all depends on the kind of facility, where it is, but it's a ratio of more than 10 to 1. Um, so, economics. If I, by the way, you can also show, when I was, in, I was giving a series of talks in Texas um, in April, and they said, don't take away our pickup trucks. <laughs> don't raise our gasoline taxes. Don't take away our guns. Um, but show, show us that walking is not really good for business. And so I came up with every bit of evidence on the face of the earth that, that in fact, what you can show is that improving walking and cycling facilities, investing in walking and cycling facilities, really does. It increases reaching of sales of businesses that are along, for example, cycle tracks. Um, it, it reduces health care costs, and that actually has an impact on everyone, firms and employees as well, and so forth. So anyway, the, I want to just let you know, we have the, that uh, Andy and Nick have been working on this uh, as well, but we, the CDC uh, finances the biannual benchmark and report for walking and cycling, we have an entire chapter on the economic benefits of walking and cycling. And so there's a lot of evidence that you can use. I mean, I don't think I have to convince you that there are these economic benefits, but you can use that evidence to convince the people you think need to be convinced. It is good for business. Obviously, it's like no brainer. Walking and cycling is good for the environment. I don't think I have to prove that to anyone. That's why the Sierra Club is supportive of walking and cycling. Energy efficient. Yeah, sure, you use up energy walking and cycling, but it's good energy. <laughs> it means you could eat more cookies <laughs> without getting fat. 
Um, it's not really using anything really in the way of non-renewable resources. Extraordinarily healthy. And in that book that I wanted to wave around, <laughs> in one of the chapters of these books, there's a whole chapter written by three of my public health uh, colleagues, uh, Adrian Bauman, Jan Girard, and Chris Rizzo, uh, all, well, actually Jan's in Melbourne and the other two in Sydney, and they look at the entire range of health benefits, physical health benefits, social health benefits, mental health benefits as well. Um, so really, uh, that's a very, very important aspect. And of course, uh, then the indirect environmental health benefits of walking and cycling as well, because there's no negative environmental impact. Um, and incidentally, those of you who might think walking and cycling are dangerous, uh, it's not that they're perfectly safe, safe, but nothing is. Nothing is perfectly safe. Whether it's flying or driving a car or whatever it is, everything involves some level of risk. But the studies, every single study I have shown, I've seen, and that includes the, the chapter in the book that reviews all of these studies. And the ratio of benefits to cost, that is the health benefits, far, far, far exceed the traffic dangers in terms of health costs. And so in that respect as well, it's another reason for supporting uh, uh, walking and cycling, really very, very good uh, for your health. And they're fun too. I don't think I have to convince you on that. That's why it's not the main reason I cycle. I cycle mainly to get from point A to point B, but a lot of people cycle because it's fun. Unfortunately, we lag behind uh, many countries in terms of levels of walking and cycling. Uh, the, these travel surveys, the, most of these that are shown there are national travel surveys, and they do show that the United States lags far behind the countries, say, of Northern Europe. Maybe it's a third uh, or a half of the level of walking and cycling that you get in, say, Germany or the Netherlands or Denmark, which you'll all Scandinavia, Belgium, Switzerland, Austria, and so forth. Um, so we do have much, much, much lower levels of walking and cycling. Uh, by the way, let, let's you be confused. Those countries that have an asterisk, that just means it's the commute to work. So uh, because this, this question came up when I was in, in Vancouver, and it turns out that people walk and cycle to work much less than they walk and cycle for other purposes, such as recreational purposes or visiting with family and so forth. That's specifically for us. So anyway, the point is we're, we, we do indeed lag far behind other countries, but there's a huge potential here in the United States. Yes, even in our extremely decentralized, low-density, sprawling, car-centric uh, United States, that we have 27%, more than a quarter of all of our trips are a mile or shorter, and 41% are um, two miles or shorter. Well, that's a really, really easy distance to cover by bike. Especially because I'm electric bike. <laughs> but totally aside from that, I mean, really, it's like, it's very, very easy to bike two miles. It really is. In fact, it's one of the optimal distances that you have. It turns out if you look at the, um, the distribution of distances that people bike, when it's a really short trip, people are more likely to walk. So when you get to like a mile and a half, two miles, three miles, that's actually one of the higher percentages of people who are then going to cycle. One of the false assumptions, I think, or misconceptions that we probably have is the only reasons that Europeans, the only reason that Europeans cycle more than we do and walk more than we do is because the trips are just much shorter in Europe than they are in the United States. And so we're just stuck. I mean, it's, it's not our fault, it's just that our cities are so sprawled, our trips are so long. And the answer to that is it's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> I mean, it's not entirely the one, that's not quite true. It is true that European cities tend to be more compact than American cities, that's true. It is also true that, in general, trip distances tend to be shorter in European cities than in American cities. But even if you control for trip distance, and you look at levels of walking and cycling for the same trip distances, what you can see here is that in Germany, in the Netherlands, and Denmark, that in those countries, people make a much, much, much higher percentage of their trips by walking and cycling within each of those trip distance categories. So it's not just a matter of American cities being so sprawled with the small trip distances. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that doesn't play any role at all, because urban form, built environment, are certainly very important in terms of effective levels of walking and cycling. But 
uh, that even when you control for trip distance, that we could do a lot to increase levels of water. So I, in my personal opinion, I'm getting ahead of myself now, I know, but I think the reason for our low levels is that we don't provide safe, convenient, comfortable, connected walking and cycling facilities, which not only are connected to each other, that is a, a connected, integrated, comprehensive walking network, cycling network, but we also need to connect them to public transportation. I think it's really important not to leave out public transportation. We talk about sustainable transportation and active travel because there will be trips that are simply too long to make by walking or cycling. And so you can make the long trip by subway or bus or train, whatever, uh, and then you use the bike or you walk to get from the station to wherever you're going to. So anyway, I, I just think it's really important to see these as uh, integrated package of, of modes that work together. One of the unfortunate facts uh, in countries that speak English, I guess really, uh, is that we have a huge gender gap. If you're in the United States, Australia, by the way, only 20% of bike trips are by women. We have about 25% here in the United States. Uh, you can see slightly higher percentages in Canada and in the UK, but still much, much lower than the percentage of bike trips made by women in the United States. In Europe, if you look at the, um, any, I mean, this actually applies to all of Scandinavia. Look at Sweden, look at Helsinki, <laughs> look at uh, uh, Denmark, look at Germany, look at the Netherlands. You really find in these European countries a 50-50 mix. There's really just no gender gap. There's no gender difference in the levels of, of cycling. A women cycle, in fact, more than men do, even in the Netherlands and in Denmark. You'll see that. 55% of all bike trips in Denmark are by women, and 56% of all bike trips uh, in the Netherlands are by women. So by no means, absolutely positively, no way you can say that somehow men are more somehow built to cycle than women are. That's just ridiculous. Um, but I can tell you that women are demanding. <laughs> and it's good that they're demanding, because I think all of us should ask for safe, convenient, comfortable, uh, cycling facilities, and that's what's going to get not just women on bikes, but it's going to get seniors on bikes, children on bikes, and people like me on bikes who tend to be risk averse, which is most of the population, like 80%. So anyway, this is a really important uh, issue with the gender gap. This is a wonderful photo that Susan Handy took and let me use. Um, uh, she was in Copenhagen, and you can see, this is a typical view of uh, Copenhagen, this, this particular bike. Uh, it's a cycle track, actually. It's crossing an intersection here, so it's painted blue. Uh, but you can see, there are a lot of women on bikes, <laughs> and they're not wearing helmets. I know that's a big issue. I'm not going to get into it right now. Um, but you can see, um, they're not in the least bit intimidated by that pink Mercedes uh, that's behind them. Uh, I'm not either. <laughs> but anyway, that, I, just, I just think it's really important to get women on bikes. And in the chapter in the book on uh, women in cycling, uh, there's no way that I, as a man, am going to write a chapter on women in cycling. I mean, that's taking a risk. <laughs> it really is. Uh, but uh, Jan Gerard, uh, Susan Handy, and Jen Jennifer Dill wrote this chapter together. And the way I would sum up the chapter is, if you really want to increase cycling, you got to get women on bikes. you got to listen to women. Do what they tell you to do. <laughs> And that'll make things okay. <laughs> that you really, if you what you've got to design a cycling policy that really is for all ages and all abilities and for all segments of your society. And one way to measure that is the percentage of women, the percentage of bicyclists for women. If you look out there and everyone out there is a young man on a fancy bike, you have failed. You want to get as many women as you have men, you want to get kids, you want to get seniors, you want to get people of all different abilities. Um, and that, that's going to be the sign that you've had some success in your cycling policy. The other issue is age. Some of you might not know it, but you're getting older. <clears throat> and it's a good thing <laughs> because the alternative is not so great. Well, maybe it is. Who knows? We don't know what happened. <laughs> um, but anyway, you are all getting older. And so should every single one of you, even if that, should be considering, now as I get older, how am I going to get around? And I'm going to have to rely on my family, my neighbors, my friends, or some stupid dial ride service. I don't remember, but it comes once a week or once a day. If I can walk or bike to where I need to go to, that gives me mobility, it gives me independence.
independent. It gives me very valuable physical activity, which is generating, as is shown in that chapter on the health benefits of cycling, it's generating physical health benefits, social health benefits, and mental health benefits. And so I think it's really important that we make walking and cycling safe, convenient, and feasible for all age groups, including those age groups as we're getting older. The astounding thing I find in these data, and these are, by the way, quite comparable travel surveys. These are national travel surveys for all trip purposes. And what it's showing here is that in the United States, there's sort of a low level of walking and cycling at every age group. It's, it tends to decline a little bit, but I wouldn't say dramatically, but 0.5% of all trips by those people who are 65 and older are by bike in the United States, compared to 3% of those 5 to 15 and 0.8% of those pretty much in the middle. But look, at, look at Germany, the Netherlands, and Denmark. As people get older, I threaten to do this, by the way. <laughs> this is called the old fashioned pointer. <laughs> I'll use it just once. I, just I can't resist it. But just note this. As people get older in these countries, they are getting, they are making a higher and higher percentage of their trips. I think that's a, a little bit more. <laughs> anyway, the point that as Germans, the Danes, and the Dutch are getting older, they're actually making a higher percentage of their trips by walking and cycling. And I think so that should be also a goal here in Seattle, in the United States, in North America, mm -hmm. to make walking and cycling safe for all age groups. And I'm, as I said before, I'm very glad that in the official uh, new 2013, which just came out this month, uh, the uh, cycling plan for Seattle, it has officially adopted that, making cycling possible, comfortable, feasible, and safe for all age groups and all abilities. So I really, this is sort of my motto, cycling and walking for everybody from all parts of society. And I do think that one way you do that is you make cycling safe. You make cycling safe in fact, but also you make it feel safe, you make it feel comfortable. And you get the two, they're related, but different things. One is the actual level of safety, the other is the perceived level of safety. And by the way, most people who don't normally ride a bike have a misperception that cycling is extremely dangerous. But a lot of that is a false conception, really. I'm not gonna say it's totally safe. And in fact, the next graph shows exactly that, that in fact, cycling is much more dangerous in the United States than it is in these European countries. But the really good news in this slide is you can make walking and cycling very, very safe indeed. If you look at the levels, you look at Denmark and the Netherlands, you can see extremely low levels, low rates. This is all controlling for amount of travel, so it's controlling for uh, it's kilometers that are cycled, kilometers that are walked, so it's obviously exposure rates. And what it's saying is when you do that, you find that uh, cycling in the Netherlands and Denmark is only about a tenth as dangerous as it is in the United States, or to put it another way, ten times safer than it is in the United States. Was it always that way? No. You probably assume that it was, but you're wrong. Um, in fact, in the 1950s, 1960s, there were a lot, there was a huge number in cyclists and pedestrian fatalities. I mean a big increase, a doubling, tripling, quadrupling in cyclist and pedestrian fatalities. Why? Because there was this sudden increase in motorization, a big increase in car use. In, at first, in the 1950s, 1960s, these European countries and cities decided, we'll sort of do what the United States is doing. In the war, they must have done something right, so we're going to sort of adopt these American policies. They seem like the modern thing to do. So they did that for about two decades. They found out it was a disaster. It was an environmental disaster, it was a public health disaster, huge increase in, in fatalities, it was ruining the centers of their cities, and they totally turned around their policies. I'll tell, discuss that in just a second, but you can see a, this is all relative to 1970 as a hundred. And you can see that a huge increase, 60 to 80 percent decline in cyclist fatalities in Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, even in the UK. Likewise with pedestrian fatalities, an 80 percent to 90 percent reduction. That's a huge reduction, folks. 80 to 90 percent reduction in pedestrian fatalities. That means they were only about a tenth as high uh, in 2008 as they were in 1970. So, 
Again, it wasn't always this way. What did these European countries and cities do? Well, as I say, they reversed their policies completely. In the 1950s and 60s, very pro-car. They wanted to adapt the city to the car. Big mistake. And one city after another, one country after another, for all sorts of reasons. There were environmental reasons, there was a, a traffic safety reasons, and there were others as well. Uh, they completely turned around their policies. Just as an example, as an illustration of just how dramatic this was, this is a bridge in Freiburg in southwest Germany uh, in the 1960s. Today, they, it is now a bicycle bridge. And, and this is a big deal. Because then, who owns the roads? Who really? I mean, these are proud, roads are probably the most important public spaces we have in the United States and probably in every country, both in residential areas and downtown. Who has a priority to use these roads? Do we give them to these motor vehicles or to human beings? Do we put the give the priority to healthy, active modes of transportation that are good for the environment and for public health? and for economic reasons as well, or do we give that space to the car? And they made the decision. We are going to promote walking and cycling, and they made this bridge exclusively for pedestrians and cyclists. You can't see the pedestrians very well, but they're on both sides of that bridge, so just to the left and to the right of that blue uh, barrier. Likewise, maybe even more important was the comprehensive traffic calming of residential neighborhood streets in virtually all German cities, in virtually all uh, Dutch cities. This is the same street, Klaarstraat is the name of the street, in Freiburg, Germany, and this could be repeated 10,000 times. This is extremely typical of what has been done to German streets in terms of traffic calm. It is comprehensive. It is not just one street there and one street there. It is virtually the entire residential area. It doesn't include arterials. There's a different treatment for arterial roads. They have a different purpose. But for local residential streets, you have a comprehensive policy of traffic calming at 30 kilometers per hour or less. Often it's 7 kilometers an hour if it's a home zone or the Germans call the play streets. You should but you'll see here, if you look at this, first of all, it doesn't look better to the right. <laughs> on the left, you have cars that are parked even on the sidewalks. That, that's not, for me, a street that's inviting to walking or cycling. Uh, and you can see just the looks of this, and there's no pedestrian scale lighting and so forth. The picture to the right, you have planters, you have uh, benches where people sit on, you have bike parking and so forth. The street is narrower, which forces, it's not just a matter of by the law being 30 kilometers or less, it actually forces the cars to go more slowly. So there's all sorts of traffic calming devices, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just, this is really, really important because it turns these residential streets, and this is about 90% of the streets you've got in the city, it turns them into walking and bicycling streets. And I think that's just off, awfully, largely uh, overlooked. And that's why I think neighborhood greenways are really good. <laughs> and I, on the bike ride I took with uh, Robin yesterday, how many times did I say, Robin, all it needs is more signage, it's practically there. I mean, you've got so many neighborhood streets. You've got the, tr the traffic islands here, the, the, the traffic circles. I mean, was you really well landscaped? I'm thinking, that should be a bike boulevard or a neighborhood uh, greenway because it's really safer for, for walking, it's safer for cycling, it's, it's a more pleasant environment. So I really think that this is of also much lower cost than a special bicycling facility. It's lower cost, it's more comprehensive, and it's going to cover like 90% of the streets. It gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of your routing. So I'm all for neighborhood greenways. Another example of this dramatic change, don't worry, I'll eventually <laughs> stop with examples, but I think these photos are pretty dramatic. To the left, this is in Munster again, uh, you can see uh, this is the uh, Cathedral Square. It's, there's actually two parts to it, but this is the right part of the Cathedral Square. Uh, and in the 1950s, 1960s, it was simply a parking lot. Again, it just shows you what the priorities were back in the 1950s, 1960s. Well, after all this public policy change, it was turned into a car-free area. In fact, Freiburg is one of the largest car-free zones in, in all of Germany, and it was one of the first as well. Now, it's a, a, except for Sunday, it's a daily market, very, very popular. What was the result of this shift in politics? It was, I've already shown you the, the previous slides, the tremendous improvement in cycling and pedestrian safety. So first of all, things became much, much safer. But number two, 
you also had a big increase in levels of cycling. So if you look at, and these are not small cities, we're not talking about cities like nothing against Davis or Boulder, but those are pretty small cities. These are big cities, Nuremberg, Berlin, Cologne, Munich. I mean, these are cities in, with a million or more population. They double, triple them. In the case of Nuremberg, triple the percentage of trips by bike. In Cologne, double. In Munich, more than double, and so forth and so on. And the other thing I would just like to point out, and that is, I wonder if this cursor works. It sort of does, yeah. If you look here at uh, Amsterdam and Copenhagen, again, you probably have assumed, oh, those were always bicycling paradises, uh, Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Not true. I mean, it's true they had a fairly level, high level, of, fairly high level of cycling, but note the big increase from 25% of trips to 37%, 38% of trips. That is a, remember that the US percentage of bicycling is 1%. <laughs> so an increase from 25 to 37, that's a 12 percentage point increase in the mode share of cycling. And that's compared to our 1% here in the United States. And it's a big shift. And if any of you have seen the wonderful video by Jan Gale, who's a, an architect, urban designer in Copenhagen, he shows the pictures over time. He said, 40 years ago, Copenhagen was not at all friendly to cyclists or to pedestrians. But over time, over four decades, he the city has been totally transformed into a pedestrian cycling, uh, not just kind of Mecca, as so the example for other cities uh, to follow. Um, there are also cities here. Uh, this isn't so matter of much of recovering from previous cycling levels, but these cities really have almost no history, no culture or tradition of high levels of utilitarian daily cycling. Uh, and the most dramatic example is this one of Sevilla, Spain. Um, they they uh, built over 100 kilometers of cycle tracks, physically separated on street cycle tracks in Sevilla. Um, and such as you have on, um, what's the name again of the cycle track here in? Dexter Avenue. Dexter Avenue. No, that's not Dexter, it's another one. Linden, Linden. Linden, Linden, Linden Avenue has, has like one or two miles of, uh, Dexter has the Buckley Black Foot. But anyway, I'll show you a picture of it, you'll see. Anyway. So these, these cities, where there's Paris, Bogota, Sevilla, uh, Barcelona, they really didn't have a tradition of cycling. But over the past 10, 20 or so years, they have implemented a lot of policies with bike sharing, for example, in Paris, uh, also in London with the Barclays Bike Share. In Sevilla, you have an extensive program. They have bike sharing as well, but they also had extensive uh, cycle tracks put in. Bogota, Colombia, they had over 300 kilometers of cycle tracks put in. So, here you have the, it is possible, if you do the right things, to even in cities with no sort of culture, so to speak, of, of cycling, you can vastly increase levels of cycling. So the notion, by the way, the point of all this is, yes, even we Americans can cycle. Uh, we might not have a, a tradition of cycling, it doesn't mean we can't do it. Uh, and likewise with walking, of course. And this is just an example, this is the uh, one part. One example, one of the 100 kilometers of cycle tracks in uh, Central Spain. And I think I mentioned this in Vancouver as well. I don't really like the design, to fight the truth, because I always think to myself, I'm going to get my handles more stuck in one of those uh, posts, and there could be a much better design to make that physical separation. Um, but as a result of these cycle tracks going in, there in fact was a huge, more than a tenfold increase in cycling, and a big increase, especially in women cycling and kids cycling. So um, I, I think. You can be a proof is made the design there, but at least it had the impact of increased cycling and also making it safer. Um, we have done a lot of good things here in North America. We just updated this using 2011 ACS. Uh, and it's just amazing. And these are all big cities. And in virtually all of them, we've had a doubling, tripling, quadrupling of level of bike mode share, the percentage of workers getting to their workplace by bike has increased dramatically. And look at Chicago. I mean, who thinks of Chicago as being a bicycle city? They, they quit, quintuple, five-fold increase in the bike mode share in Chicago over this period since 1990. In New York, there's a, a tripling. Uh, and then, of course, you have Portland going from you know, almost a seven-fold increase in Portland. But the point is, it is possible. And this didn't happen by accident. You know, we didn't change our genes. We didn't really change our American culture. Uh, but what we did is implement a lot of policies that made cycling safer, more convenient, and more possible. We built facilities, and we also introduced a number of programs, including bike sharing programs. So you can see here, I mean, really a boom 
in cycling in these North American cities. And what's happened here in Seattle? If you look over the past six years, there's been a, a, a positive trend as well. If you look, it sort of goes a little bit zigzag, but overall it's a pretty good trend, going from 9.2% to 12.5% of work commuters either walking or cycling to work. So uh, I'd like to see it to be 20% or 25%, but at least it's going in the right direction. I think that's uh, good news. And with the new bike plan that I saw, I mean, I see a lot of good things in there. Emphasis on cycle tracks, emphasis on neighborhood greenways, um, connections, having a complete network. So I think Seattle really is on the right path. Um, so lots of things. There, there really is no one silver bullet. Uh, some of them, often at the end of a lecture, you can say, okay, just tell me one thing. <laughs> What's the one thing we should do? Well, there, there really is no just one thing. On the one hand, it's clear you have to have good, safe, convenient infrastructure. You have to have the sidewalks, crosswalks, intersection facilities, whether it's a cycle track, whether it's a buffered bike lane, an on-street uh, uh, lane without buffers. It, it, you have to have that infrastructure there. And again, the key is it has to be connected. I, I, <laughs> I think I have a picture of this somewhere. But what I really hate is you'll have a sidewalk that just ends. <laughs> And then, then what do you do? You know, or or, or a, a cycle track that just ends, or a bike lane that just ends, and then you're forced onto a busy roadway, and it's especially then dangerous for someone who, who isn't all that skilled as a cyclist, who doesn't, and also for say kids who don't have the experience, for seniors who I know I, you know, I can't hear as well, I can't see maybe as well, I might have slower reflexes, uh, or I'm daydreaming, whatever it might be, um, and so I just think it's really important to have this connected. Uh, network. So that's really the key word, a network of walking and cycling facilities and to get rid of the gaps in the system because in a way the gaps are the most dangerous of all because you sort of, um, you seduce people <laughs> into sort of getting on this the, this bike lane or that cycle track and then all of a sudden, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and then you, you're in the middle of on a busy road. So another thing that's actually crucial as I sort of suggested at the beginning is integrating walking and cycling uh, with public transportation because you just can't make all your trips by walking or something. You can't do it. But with, together with public transportation, it really encourages walking and cycling because 90% of all transit trips in the United States start off as walk trips. And 3% start off as bike trips. That's 93% of access trips to public transit are active transportation. And by the way, not only that, if you've ever ridden the New York City subway, there's a lot of activity there too. You're going up and down stairs from one platform to another. I, I mean, I can't tell you how much physical activity I've gotten transferring among different lines of the subway in New York City. Uh, so anyway, another issue, traffic calming. I've just mentioned that. I'll show you examples of this in a while. Mixed use zoning and uh, urban design made your streets and cycle tracks attractive. When we were in Vancouver, let me tell you, we stayed on Hornby Street. And as I was, I was 19 and I was so, I was almost in ecstasy. <laughs> I was looking at this corridor of Thornby Street. It has the cycle track, which I'll show you in a second. And then you know, it has a very nice pedestrian promenade and lots of trees. And I'm thinking, yes, that is a really great public space. Absolutely, positively. And it's a matter of urban design. They even have special patterns on the walkway. I mean, it makes it attractive, safe. I mean, they had lavender planted in the in the middle, and so you were you know you're not just taking a walk. You know, wow. <laughs> Restrictions on motor vehicle use. This is a toughie here in North America, Canada, and in the United States. Um, just that that's the thing. I think Europeans do much better than we do. Whether it's uh, Reducing speeds, which is absolutely crucial when it comes to pedestrian and cycling safety, whether it's uh, eliminating through traffic in residential neighborhoods, increasing the cost of gasoline, or increasing taxes, and so forth. But it's one I'll come to a little bit later. Traffic education, traffic regulations, I'll get to those in turn, but I, I want to get to them. I started filing at 750. Okay, so one thing, one way you can encourage walking and cycling is having these car free zones. And if you have ever been to a European city, virtually every European city, large, medium, and small, has some sort of a car-free district. Not just a pedestrian mall, not just uh, one street or two streets, but really a whole area of the inner city that is car-free. It's a connected network 
of car free streets. And that's the crucial thing. Because if you just make one street car free, well, you just divert your cars to the other street, and then you just uh, sort of putting the problem from one street to another. So I think it's important to have not only comprehensive traffic calming of residential neighborhoods, but also to have an integrated network of car free streets in the centers of the cities. And certainly this livened up a lot of European cities. This is one of the famous, one of the first actually car free zones was in, here in Copenhagen. This is the one I saw this just last August. One of my public health colleagues, Marie Demer, uh, took this photo. <laughs> she took the photo. Uh, we were sort of walking down the street. I mean, that was a street for cars, believe it or not. That was a street for cars, this narrow street. And look at this. I mean, it's lively, it's pleasant. There's no air pollution. I mean, you're not breathing in the fumes from motor vehicles going back and forth. And that must be great for business. They've got the hundreds of customers there, I mean, right at the door. And they're going to provide parking. You know, isn't that great? One of the advantages of walking is you don't have to provide parking for pedestrians. I think that's really good. And by the way, that's a really, really nice design. I like the sort of a low scale, uh, say human scale design here. I mean, you really want to stop. It makes you want to take your time going through this zone. So urban design is absolutely crucial in, in all of this. Uh, we do have pedestrian malls in, we pride them out in many cities. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. You never know. I mean, they just pulled one out in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, uh, where my brother and my sister live, but they've been very successful. For example, the, the pedestrian mall, uh, or the battle hall in, in Boston has been extremely successful, so it just depends. So this is the view outside of my uh, office uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, where I'm sabbatical, which might tell you this was in February, <laughs> and so uh, no wonder I liked being there. But you know, when you really, including this campus right here, I had a really nice walk across the campus just uh, an hour or so ago, and uh, I mean, it's interesting. It, how we have hundreds, maybe not thousands, but hundreds of these car, mainly car-free college campuses. And it'd be nice if we could extend this to other kinds of uh, uses of land in the United States as well. But it certainly is a very pleasant and safe environment for walking and for cycling. Uh, this is in Santa Barbara, uh, where I was last October. And as you can see, there's a few people on bikes there. <laughs> they have wonderful facilities for walking and for cycling. And you can't see it here, but they really separate out the cyclists from the pedestrians because the cyclists are going at a different speed, they have some different kinds of movements and so forth. And I think that to the extent that it's possible, and especially when you have high volumes of cycling and walking, you really want to separate the two modes. That's what the Dutch do all the time. The other thing you can do, this is also in Santa Barbara, is uh, street closures. I mean, this is a permanent street closure. This used to be a street for cars, <coughs> and it was turned into a street for pedestrians. But I'll add something else. And note, if you just look at this, it's very pleasant. So again, the urban design element in this is crucial. You have pleasant, you have really beautiful flowers, trees, interesting pavement design. It's a very interesting public space. It's inviting. It encourages you to walk and cycle. And I, I mean, what I, what I find is when I'm walking through such a space, either this space or the one I showed you before in Quebec City, I don't even feel that I'm exerting any energy at all. I'm getting this physical activity and enjoying the space. And it, it's just, maybe that's part of, I guess it's maybe a little bit Buddhist or something. But it's like getting into the moment. You enjoy it so much that you almost don't even realize exactly that, that you're exerting energy to do it. Uh, and you can do the impossible. Who, 20 years ago, would have thought it would be possible to make Broadway car-free between uh, Macy's and Carroll Square and, and Times Square, and yet it was done. The impossible is possible. And if you could do it in New York City, where it's really difficult to get things done, you can do it just about anywhere. It's been extremely successful. I mean, if you're there now, and you think back, how in the world was this ever for cars? Really, I mean, it's just been extremely successful. And certainly great for business. I mean, wonderful for business. The other, another example here in New York City, there are a lot of interesting things in New York City. The High Line, this is an abandoned, junky sort of a freight line. Of course, they copied Paris. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they did a good, did a good way. And there are other cities that are now copying New York. Uh, there's a number of these abandoned, elevated uh, freight lines. But you can see here that it's been a very, in fact, it's almost too popular. <laughs> I mean, when I was there, good luck finding a bench to sit on. I mean, it was really, really, really popular. It's become a tourist attraction. But not only that, and this is a big selling point when it comes to business, it has totally revitalized this whole neighborhood. I mean, you have pubs and restaurants and bars and jazz clubs and you name it. It has revitalized that whole part of, of Manhattan, and they're extending it now north 
to the west, I think over to where the convention center is, the Javits are. Anyway, another example of it. You can be inventive, you can be creative, and make it. A, it's a really interesting space, I think, in urban design. Great views of the Hudson River. Some of the uh, part of the walkway goes through buildings. Really, really deep. Um, crosswalks, I mean, they're a little bit less exotic, but really important. Uh, the crosswalk you see at the top is the kind of a crosswalk we have in New Brunswick, New Jersey. <laughs> this crosswalk, I pretty much have to cross almost every day uh, because I never <coughs> ever drive. Um, and that sign is usually blocked. Uh, it's, as you can see, a very long crosswalk, so there's a long distance you have to cover. There's no median refuge island. Um, you're looking, it's two way street, so you're looking both directions and, and having to look across a long distance, I think it's very unsafe. And I can tell you, I mean, the number of times I've almost been killed on there that I can't, well, I haven't tried to count. But too many. By comparison, uh, the bottom photo is in Santa Barbara, you can see the There's a stop sign, it forces the cars to stop. It's much better bar crossing, uh, uh, and it's much, much safer. And it's actually right across from the school in Santa Barbara, so it better be safe. This is a great photo. I owe this to Bob. <laughs> you can raise your hand, Bob. How did this sidewalk ever get approved here in Seattle? <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely suicidal. <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough that it goes out into the street, but then to make things even more interesting, you have to poke your head around to see what car is going to come and hit me. It's like, Whoa! How did you? Uh, how did that get a zoning approval or a bill? Uh, it's unbelievable that things can go through there. Well, I'm in favor of complete streets. It's sort of a big movement here in the United States, uh, in Canada, sort of the way where they've already been doing it in Europe for many years. We just have to put a nice sort of a name to it. But it's saying provide facilities for pedestrians, for cyclists, uh, and for dogs, <laughs> so you can even walk your dog there on the bike. But again, I want to come back to the issue of urban design. Look how interesting that is. You've got really nice shrubbery, you've got palm trees. It's, it's a very, very pleasant and interesting, engaging uh, environment there. Um, in terms of uh, mixed-use paths, this is most of what we have in the United States, at least for cycling, um, which is it works OK, as long as you don't have too much walking, too much cycling. But when it gets really, really heavily used, you do get conflicts between the cyclists and the pedestrians. I mean, you can try to be cooperative and understanding and tolerant and so forth. Um, this, by the way, is the second most frequently traveled recreational path in the United States. It's the Metapan Trail north of Boston. Well, if you go to Europe, the, the, one of the principles, whether it's Germany or the Netherlands or Denmark, is separation. Separation of pedestrians from cyclists and, of course, separation of motor vehicles. So you see this is actually this photograph, but this is a um, circumferential, uh, they call it the bicycle expressway, but it goes all the way around the city of Munster, so it's about eight kilometers, I think it is, in circumference. And you can see on the right and the left are walking facilities. In the middle is exclusively for, for bicyclists. And just to show you I mean, how considerate they are in terms of considering the needs of pedestrians, on the left-hand side, you have a hard walking surface. And on the right-hand side, you have a soft walking surface. <laughs> so that if you're, say, jogging, you would jog on the soft walking surface. If it's rainy and muddy, you would uh, walk on the uh, harder surface. Same sort of a thing, but this is in Quebec City. They just recently, it was a year or two years ago, uh, they built this. Uh, and again, you have the separation, the, the, the bikeway to the left, a little bit further away from the water. And then you have the walkway to the right. It's actually really, really pleasant. Uh, cycle tracks, the big sort of trend of the moment, and you're getting them here in Seattle uh, as well. You have one so far, but there's more coming. Uh, and this is, it's really physical separation. It's an on-street facility, so it's right on the street. But you use various kinds of separation. Uh, Montreal has the largest network of cycle tracks in North America over 100 kilometers, and you can see on the left is the older design that they have in Montreal, where they just have bollards and park cars for the physical separation for the moving traffic. It's a bi-directional uh, uh, cycle track. To the right is the new design, where you actually have a permanent concrete island there that separates uh, the cyclists from the motor vehicles. This is pretty new. This is like two or three years old, and a friend of mine, Fiona Campbell, who is the bike planner of Sydney, Australia, sent me this just for this presentation, actually. 
and that is you wanted me to show this, that this used to be a street with no facilities of any kind for cyclists, and there was very, very little cycling, so they built this facility, this is a very, very nice facility, get back to urban design, get, look at how pleasant that is. I mean, does it, it's just a pleasant experience, cycling, so it's not just that it's safe, but it's also pleasant. And they, over the three years, that they built this system of cycle traps in Sydney, Australia, they more than doubled the level of cycling. And also increased, especially, cycling by children and by women. So again, if you want to make cycling possible for all age groups and for all abilities, you've really got to make cycle traps a part of the solution. There's no way it's going to be the whole solution. You can't afford it. They're, they're more expensive than, say, neighborhood greenways or, or bike lanes, but it really is important as a part of the overall solution where you have an arterial of some sort, or this is probably parallel to a more important arterial. The other thing I wanted to note at the top there is that uh, they actually hired a private consultant firm to look at the benefits and the costs of this facility, and they found that the benefits offset the costs by a ratio of more than three to one. So, <laughs> so from an economic point of view, it was a, a winner. Uh, but it was also a winner in terms of doubling levels of cycling and encouraging more women uh, and more kids and more seniors to cycle. Uh, we just, uh, this is one of the Hornby Street cycle track, uh, and this is the before and after, just to so show how you can transform the street. Now, that's the typical cyclist who doesn't mind getting mixed up in this sort of a heavy vehicle traffic, but it's not me. That's not going to be me on that bike. I'm not going to do it. It's just not going to happen. That to me is, it feels dangerous, it's uncomfortable, and I would just guess 90% of the population, no matter what your age is or your, your gender, you're not going to do it. And that's why some few Americans get on their bike. If you look to the right, this is the same same street, and this is where you have the cycle traffic. It's painted green, and they have wonderful intersection facilities, by the way. At every intersection, because we saw this very carefully, very well marked, they have really bright green crossing. So there's no way that a motorist is going to misunderstand that you know, that's where there's the crossing of the bicycle. You have to be very careful of how you're going to reach your intersection, which I'll show you just a little bit later. The other thing I want to mention is, if Arkansas and Walmart can do it, so can you. <laughs> Something that amazed me. I just couldn't believe it. I'm not a fan of Walmart. I'm really not. I'm not at all. But the fact that the headquarters of Walmart has this cycle track financed by Walmart to get their employees to work. I mean, wow! I mean, that you could even get a firm like Walmart to build cycle tracks. In Seattle, we know it's more progressive than Walmart, aren't you? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm probably going to get sued by Walmart here. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, well, this is the one on Lincoln Avenue. I just got this from, uh, I think it was yesterday or earlier this morning, uh, from Seattle EOT. So I assume that <laughs> they know. And that this is the first cycle track. Uh, Dexter Avenue is a buffered bike lane as far as, no, well, I'll show you, you'll see a picture of Dexter in just a second. But anyway, you can see here um, uh, that you have special traffic signals. You have, again, that sort of a, a green marking and so forth. So you're starting. I think in total it's like one, I'm not sure if it's a mile, but it's something like that. But it's, it's, a, it's a start. It's a small start, but it's certainly a start in the right direction. And the newly approved bike plan is, in fact, uh, going to build many more of these cycle tracks, uh, as well as neighborhood greenways. Right, Eli? <laughs> Here's the one. Uh, I think one of these is Dexter Street, but I'm not sure which one it is. Um, anyway, examples here of, um, maybe it's the top two. Is that Dexter Street? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, where you have the, it, by, by, by having the, um, the bike lane go around the bus stop, it avoids the conflict or minimizes the conflict at any rate of passengers getting off the buses and into the direct path of the bicyclists. So you can see that actually in both of those top photos. And the other two were other sort of facilities that are trying to protect bicyclists a little bit more. Uh, special signs saying, watch out when you're making the right hand turn as you're uh, going across that bike lane and, and so forth. So there's various things, a buffered bike lane uh, such as this. Uh, in New York, this is on Grand Street, I believe it is to the left. Um, where you have a buffer, they have several buffered bike lanes in New York City. This is the one in Grand Street, and the one to the right is in Vancouver. I can't remember, Heather's, Heather Avenue or Heather Street, I think it is. Um, but anyway, it gives you, it doesn't give you the physical barrier, but it gives you more space. And if I can't get the physical barrier, I'll at least 
get gladly take the additional space, and the extra sort of diagonal markings. So there's another uh, warning to the motorists. The other thing you can do, and boy, do what I, I wish we had more of these in Chapel Hill and Carborough where I am now, but advanced stop line for cyclists. To tell you the truth, I just take an advanced stop line no matter what. <laughs> I don't care whether it's signed for it or not. I always go as far as I can to the front of the intersection because I want the motorist to see me. And that's the purpose, actually, of the advanced stop line. It's, it's faster that I get through the intersection first. I'm in the line of sight of the motorist. Uh, and I, I really do think it's, it's safer. And you can see you can have a, an advanced stop line. The top uh, photo is Berlin, Germany. So you can have an advanced stop line without a bike box. Or, as in the case of Portland below, you can have an advanced stop line with a bike box. The advantage of the bike box is you have a bigger area for the cyclists to wait. Um, and New York has over 100, actually, of these bike boxes. And most of them are this, this sort of design also, where you have a green painted bike lane and then a green well, speed is really important, and I think our society is much too focused on speed. We need to slow down. So this lecture won't end until 9 o'clock, but <laughs> we need to slow down. There's a wonderful book called The Praise of Slow. And, I mean, it's slow everything. Slow eating, slow sex, and slow time. <laughs> I won't go into the slow sex, but anyway. Um, the, when you... When, when travel gets very fast, when, and especially with cars, cars are the danger, but really. But actually, I've seen fast cyclists who have created some danger, too. So that, it's not just cars that create the danger, but it's mainly. 99%, by the way, of pedestrians who are killed are killed by motor vehicles, not by cyclists. This is another myth that we need to sort of clear up here. Some people think, oh, bicyclists, they're just so dangerous for pedestrians. But in fact, they kill less than 1% of the pedestrian fatalities. Uh, that's not to say it's not a concern. That's not to say we shouldn't try to avoid the conflicts of pedestrians and cyclists, but I think we need to be clear that 99% of pedestrians are killed by cars and trucks and buses and, and, and not by, by cyclists. At any rate, as this is, uh, graph shows, 30 kilometers is a really, really important threshold here. Once a car is going faster than 30 kilometers an hour, you get an exponential increase in the likelihood of a pedestrian being killed in a crash with a car. So it's really, it's not arbitrary that these European cities set up as 30 kilometers sort of standard for a traffic calm neighborhood. This is an example of traffic calming in Freiburg, Germany, and in fact, in this particular case, it's not just traffic calm, this is actually a home zone. Of the Germans call it Spielstrasse, and officially, although I think people travel a little bit faster than this, officially it's seven kilometers an hour. Uh, but this particular segment, uh, where you see that sign, you see this kid, Picking a soccer ball. It, this is a Spielstrasse. It's a play street. It's a place, to, it's like an extension of your front yard. It's saying kids can play here, you can walk here, you can bike here, and you can also drive a car here, but don't run into anyone that's in that roadway. This is meant to be a shared space, and you better not be going faster than seven kilometers an hour, and then you hit someone, you're going to be in big trouble. It, finally, looking at this, does that look like a really expensive kind of a treatment? It doesn't to me. I mean, you have paint on the street, and you have two bottles. I mean, how expensive is that? Uh, and they managed to do this on over 90% of the streets in Freiburg, Germany. This is in Berlin. Same sort of a principle. This, again, this is a, actually a Fischbierstrasse. But the, here you have 3,800 kilometers of the streets in Berlin, Germany, are traffic calm in 30 kilometers or less. 3,800 kilometers, that's 72% of all the streets in the entire city of Berlin are traffic calm at 30 kilometers or less. I mean, if only we had that in Seattle or anywhere in New Jersey, <laughs> I'd be very happy. Another issue here is shared space. Uh, you'll note here, this, see, I was on a tour of bike, not a tour, on a bike ride actually around Freiburg, uh, Germany, and we have, this is a new suburb, and you'll see there's no sidewalk. There's no bike lane. It's simply a, it's another one of these home zones, but it's a shared space. So you can bike there, you can walk there, and it's very easy. It costs less. I mean, having this sort of a shared space costs less than having a space that accommodates cars within a sidewalk and so forth and so on. Um, and you can do it in the United States as well. There's two of these uh, shared space, shared streets um, at Harvard Square. This is one other one. There's one other on the other side of Harvard Square. Uh, but as you can see, pedestrians, uh, 
with right, I'm glad that they do this, and basically taking over the street. Now, I remember going back 40 years ago or so, it was not at all pleasant. Now they've been very pleasant. Note the pedestrian scale lighting, the cafe, and so forth, the special pavement design. Again, urban design is really important here in making walking very pleasant and interesting in this particular environment. Um, you want to eliminate through traffic. You don't want through traffic in residential neighborhoods. It has no business being there. One of the main principles of traffic planning when you come to the Netherlands or Germany or Scandinavia, um, you don't want through traffic, so get rid of it. So you make these artificial dead ends, you make them permeable for, for cyclists and for pedestrians, but it's a dead end for cars. And why should anyone object to this? Because all you're doing is keeping out the through traffic, which has no business being in this residential area in the first place. You can do this in a number of ways. Uh, these are traffic diverters. The one at the top is in uh, Quebec City, the one at the bottom is in Montreal. I really enjoyed, by the way, my bike rides through both of those cities. Uh, and the cycling planners were showing me these things are really, really, very, very, obviously it just it cuts off the through traffic. And so, it, and there's a school, you see, I guess it was the one, the one, the bottom one in Montreal, there's a school to the left. Uh, and this is one of the reasons they put in the diverter, to prevent the through traffic, to slow down the traffic, and to prevent the kids from being hit. Which, by the way, when it comes to traffic calming of residential neighborhoods, there have been a number of studies. What have been the before and after impacts of these sorts of things? Um, and, oh, what is your name now? Carmen Hasklau um, has done a number of studies, and they've, they've, been, they've always shown that you get a big, big, big decrease in traffic injuries and fatalities uh, as a result of traffic calming of the neighborhoods because you're reducing the speed and, and eliminating, basically, traffic. Uh, and the biggest um, beneficiaries are kids. The biggest decrease in the pedestrian and cyclist fatality when you traffic common neighborhoods is kids. And so, in my opinion, parents ought to be up in arms if their neighborhoods aren't traffic calm. I mean, if you really care about your kids, for heaven's sakes, what's more important, your car or your kid? I mean, I think there's a, there, it's a time for Americans to say, okay, well, that's all right. But I get really passionate about this. I mean, it really is a matter of priorities. What do you think is more important? And here, in this particular case, it's, there's just no question that that lowering the speed limit and introducing traffic calming is going to really improve the whole quality of life in this neighborhood and especially protect kids. Okay, uh, here we come to greenways, which is uh, a big topic here for a number of people uh, in the audience. Um, and we have, uh, in Vancouver, has the largest network of neighborhood greenways, and we cycled on a lot of them over our study tour. That was almost the main purpose of our study tour, was to look at the neighborhood greenways. And they were great. I mean, really well signed well-connected, well-designed, and 152 kilometers of these. Um, and guess what? We're going to get them in Seattle, too. We have, like, one or two already, but we're certainly going to get more. And it was, would not, as I said before, with that bike uh, trip that I had with my trip, like, I was biking four hours uh, with Robin yesterday. It was like, I said, again, again, again. Robin, it practically is a neighborhood. Really make it into one. Give, it, give me some signage and direction. Because right now there's almost no directions at all. Just a little bit more it would make it into neighborhood greenways. It wouldn't take much at all. Uh, bike sharing, one of the key programs to stimulate more interest in cycling, to get people on bikes who haven't been on a bike maybe ever or for a long time. Um, and actually the woman who's the head, I've got to read this out, but the woman who's the head of bike planning for Cambridge, Massachusetts, Kara Seidman, uh, you know, she always tells me, John, if I give you this photo, you've got to read out this thing. I want you to look at that sign. This is their pub. It's the name of their bike sharing in Cambridge. It's actually Cambridge, Boston, and Somerville together have a bike sharing program called Top. Um, and it says, one in 10,000 historians agree if Napoleon had led his troops into battle on bike, he would have won. <laughs> <laughs> but only one in 10,000 historians agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we have over 50 bike sharing programs in North America, and it's probably the biggest, the fastest growing uh, program that we have to encourage cycling. The one in New York City just opened, I guess, was three or four weeks ago, City Bike, with 6,000 bikes, and I think there's 330 bike docking stations, and I mean, we race we see exactly how successful that is, but I think it's great that they uh, have started that up. This one I love, so most of you, probably half of you get the New Yorker anyway. Uh, but I thought that this photo on the left was so great. It just absolutely tells you what insane 
how insane our society is. People pay money to be tortured. <laughs> People pay money to go into the gym, into the sort of stuffy, musty air, and to sit on stationary bikes and to pay for the privilege of doing so, where they could actually be riding a bike, getting from point A to point B, talking to other people, getting real things done. I mean, it's behind me. We're just crazy. So anyway, uh, I thought this was just the best cover I've ever seen uh, for the New Yorker. It has good covers, by the way. So um, another thing that you need, really important at least, to promote cycling is good bike parking. Uh, and uh, one of the forms it can take is these bike corrals. I'm told that there are a few of them. We saw one. We saw one yesterday, actually. But I know there's more than just one. But it's a, a great way. I mean, for one car parking space, you're getting it. You design it, maybe 10 to 15 bike park, parking spaces. So it certainly costs less in the way of money, also in the way of space, uh, in terms of valuable urban land. Why should you devote valuable urban land to parking a car? Uh, I mean, those of you who know about Don Chup's work on parking will know. I mean, this is just, parking is probably one of those absurd policies we have in the United States that we spend so much money and so much of our urban land uh, just to park cars, which are then not used. Not that I'm encouraging using the car, but anyway. But it turns out that these bike corrals have been extremely popular. So um, Portland has the most. Uh, I've tried to update it a bunch of it. It's either 95 or 97 now. 27 in San Francisco and a lot of uh, cities around the uh, country are now putting in bike corrals because they're very popular. And these are not something that are imposed by the city on these businesses. Rather, the businesses are begging or saying, please take out the car parking, put in the bike parking, put in the bike corral. Uh, they have a waiting list in Portland. They have a waiting list in San Francisco. They can't produce these bike corrals fast enough. They've been really, really great. And I think I mentioned this when I was in Vancouver, but you know, I, the original title to the slide was Convert Car Parking to Bike Parking. And when I gave the talk in Texas, the Texas told me, no, 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 no. Don't say anything here, restrict car use. Just say it's good for business. <laughs> Great. Okay. So it's good for business. It's, I mean, if, if you're really interested mainly in business, you're going to get more customers this way. I mean, you're going to get 10 to 15 times more customers in the same space as you would get for that one car parking space. Traffic education, absolutely key, both for cyclists uh, and pedestrians, as well as for motorists. This is uh, actually Ralph Bueller, uh, my co-author on all of these things. Download this from the official German uh, driver license uh, test. And you can't see it, but with each of these photos, there's a list of sort of multiple choice. What, what, it, what are you supposed to do? A, B, C, D, E. Uh, and in every case, the right answer is you yield to the pedestrian or you yield to the cyclist. You, as the motorist, do not have the right of way. You must yield to the pedestrian or the cyclist. But in this particular case, I couldn't quite get the point. Well, what is that? I mean, I see a kid on a sidewalk, on a bike, so what were the questions there? Well, the answer is, you, as a motorist, must proactively anticipate the possibility that that kid on that bike might dart out into the street in front of you, and it is your fault, as a motorist, if you hit that kid. Because the child, and by the way, this law applies both to kids and to seniors, because the child doesn't have that experience to know how do you operate uh, safely, how do you deal with cars, and so forth and so on. And you, as a motorist, are then put on the defensive, because in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Germany, throughout Scandinavia, it is by law assumed that if the motorist is at fault, if you hit a child or a senior pedestrian or cyclist, you are at fault. That means you have to proactively avoid endangering that cyclist, even though you might think, oh, that's, that's the fault of the cyclist. Go off to the road and get hit. That's just your own fault. Not in Germany. Not, not in these countries of, of Northern Europe. It's just not the case. By the way, Ralph failed his driver's test <laughs> in Germany, uh, the driving portion, because he did not demonstrate that he was actively, proactively anticipating the possibility of endangering uh, a pedestrian who was on the sidewalk. Um, if we had that criteria in New Jersey, no one would get a license. Uh, I think the traffic <laughs> safety training is really crucial. I really, really do. By the third or fourth grade, every, uh, every girl, every boy in a Dutch, German, uh, Danish uh, school has had extensive training in safe walking and cycling. 
Uh, and what does that do? It does two things simultaneously. Number one, it ensures that every girl and every boy starts off cycling at a young age. And they learn all of the same techniques for cycling. How do you get the signals that you're giving, what the signs mean, how you watch out, for, and cycle defensively, and so forth and so on. Uh, first, they test, they, they train the kids on test course, and they take them out with real police officers to test them uh, in, the, in the real world, of real, real traffic. Uh, the other thing you've got to do is you've got to provide facilities for kids to get to school. In this case, you have a bike path that knows at least directly to the school, as you can see. This is something that I thought was really neat, that Fiona Campbell, again, the bike planner in, in uh, Sydney, uh, sent me. And that is, you see this group of kids cycling on the cycle track. Well, before the installation of the cycle track, virtually no kids at all cycled. This is, again, what Fiona told me, so I'm assuming she lives in this neighborhood. Virtually no kids at all cycle. They built the set, this physically separated cycle track. And what's the result? Now over a third of kids in Sydney cycle to school. I mean, that is really, really great. But here's something I've got. <laughs> you got this. this is going to knock your socks off if you're wearing any. <laughs> and that is, um, it turns out they just cited 20,000 kids. And what they found was those kids who walked or biked to school were much, much more mentally alert than kids who were driven to school. A lot <coughs> more mentally alert. In fact, their mental alertness was advanced by half a school year just because they walked or biked to school. So all those hormones that are going around in your brain, I guess they get generated uh, when you're walking or cycling. Um, but something that really blew me away, that walking or cycling to school for kids had more benefit in terms of mental development than having breakfast or lunch. Can you imagine that? Walking or biking to school has more impact, more benefits for your mental development than having breakfast or lunch. I mean, I, that was really, really incredible. Safe Boost to School is a great program, which unfortunately the federal government, uh, at least for the next two years, is sort of cutting back the funding for or eliminating. But states can still do it in city to city governments as well. Uh, I think it's an important program to uh, get parents together and, and children together to make it a fun event and a safe event. Because one of the one of the barriers to safe routes to school, one of the barriers to kids walking or biking to school, is that tr uh, stranger danger. That many parents are afraid that kids are going to be abducted. Something's going to happen. Of course, is the, the fear of traffic danger as well. But if you have take turns, the parents can take turns, make it a social event, make it a really fun event. Um, and it both increases the safety, you get to know your neighbors, the kids get to know the parents of other school kid, care, uh, children and so forth. Um, so I think you also have to be uh, careful to provide good crossing facilities near schools, uh, walking school buses. I have where I live in Highland Park, right across the river from New Brunswick, New Jersey, and normally up there. Um, and they also have these walking school buses, and they seem to function just perfectly. And they have all the kids are talking to each other, and the moms and the dads are. It's actually as much of a social event for the parents as it is for the kids. They probably never get to see each other except when they're walking their school, their kids to school. I mean, it's a, a really fun event, as far as I can tell. I'm almost finished now, but you can also have special events. That sometimes they're called cyclovias or open streets. Um, this happens to be in some rural Massachusetts, so it can be, if you want it, maybe a walking event. I mean, you can bike there, obviously. Well, uh, it has I think it's the third highest bike mode here in Massachusetts. But uh, this is Summer Street in Somerville. This is sick lovely in Los Angeles. Over 100,000 people participate in this. Um, over 250,000 people participate in Summer Streets um, along Park Avenue uh, in New York City, uh, which is their sort of sick movie or open streets program. Now, I think this is really dramatic. Olga uh, Sarmiento, who's a public health expert in uh, Colombia, I mean, She's a public health worker throughout the world, but she's uh, at the university in Columbia. And I thought this was dramatic. I mean, it just shows, you know, I thought bike sharing was the biggest uh, sort of trend. But maybe it's cyclovias because, wow, I mean, huge increase in the number of cities throughout the world. Well, actually, this is in America. So this is North and South America that are holding these cyclovias, these car, car free street events. Uh, with, I mean, it's not just having the cars off the, the roads, but they have sort of exercise programs, entertainment, all sorts of things that go along with it. 
And <laughs> if you really want entertainment, I'm not sure if you're aware, but this coming Saturday is the summer solstice ride uh, here in Portland, and I'm the one that put in those fig leaves. <laughs> and I better not move anything on that screen, or you're going to see things you're not supposed to see. I know I also protect the identity of the, of the people of that ride. But I'm not sure how many people ride in this ride. But the one in Portland, someone just told me they had it last weekend. It was over 10,000 people. How do 10,000 people have the courage to get on a bike naked? <laughs> because they're I mean, what has ever happened to modesty? But anyway, if it's your thing, do it. I mean, it's okay. There's, by the way, I think it's over. I think I, there was yeah over. Um, there are 74 cities in the world in 2010 anyway that have uh, it's called the World Naked Bike Ride. You can go to the internet site and tell you how many they have. Okay, this is the last slide almost, uh, and that is these are all uh, maybe you think great ideas. Uh, yeah, cycle tracks, neighborhood greenways, you know, traffic calming streets, having car-free zones, introducing bike sharing programs traffic, safety, education, schools, and so forth and so on. How do you get it implemented? How do we convince the public and politicians to implement these policies? And I can tell you, unless you do convince the public and politicians, they won't be implemented. So I think we really, I can't spend a whole lot of time on this, but we have actually a whole chapter in the book on how you implement these, these policies. But I do think it's absolutely crucial that we convey to the public just how broad these benefits are of walking and cycling. That even if you never get on a bike at all, you are benefiting from the provision of walking and cycling facilities. Even if you're spending 99% of your time in the car, maybe if you, there's going to be fewer cars on the street, less congestion for you. There's going to be less air pollution for you to breathe. There's going to be fewer parking places that are occupied that you want to occupy. Not that I'm in favor of making things easy <laughs> for car drivers, but if you need to convince car drivers, use those arguments as well. But certainly, look at the health benefits of walking and cycling, the economic benefits of walking and cycling, the whole range of benefits. And these benefits really need to be conveyed to the public through the media and to politicians as well in an understandable, convincing, clear way. Not with equations, not with a gazillion numbers, but really in a clear, convincing way. However, whether it's pictures or demonstration projects or whatever it might be. I think citizen participation is absolutely crucial. I was actually looking at the uh, uh, bike plan for Seattle, this new one that just came out. And process and citizen participation is a key uh, aspect of that plan. Um, I'll also say alliances are often crucial. I mentioned this at the very beginning forming alliances with environmentalists, public health groups, transportation groups, city planners, you know, for people who want to bring back life to our central cities. There's lots and lots of groups we can get together with, uh, livable streets, livable cities, and so forth and so on, um, because together we have much more impact in terms of uh, implementing these policies, getting that political support. I think there are many politicians who would be only too willing to implement these sorts of policies, but they feel they don't have the backing of the public, of the, of the voters. And I think that if we have lots of NGOs and various other groups who show politicians there is this support, that the public does want these things, then they will take that step. They will have the courage to then implement many of these policies. Political leadership is really, really crucial. I can say that for sure. If you look at, say, New York City, or Chicago, or Los Angeles, or Paris, or London, or Bogota, or Curitiba, those cities produce the transformation of their transportation policies because of charismatic, very powerful mayors. Um, you know, you're not always so lucky to have those, but when you get one, you, you've really got it, uh, got it made. Um, and I also think that you need to, in certain cases, develop policies and stages. I think that's what we're seeing here in Seattle. You don't all of a sudden build 500, if you could do it, I mean, if you could manage, fine. But it's unlikely you're going to, you know, off the bat, build 500 kilometers of cycle tracks here in Seattle. It's just not going to happen. You're going to build maybe a cycle track here, then a cycle track there. You could improve the, the bike lane here, improve the bike lane there. There's this intersection. Then you build 10 neighborhood greenways over here, and then the next year maybe another 10. If you, the example of this was Copenhagen. They did it over a 40-year period, consistent policies that encouraged walking and cycling. So that's uh, the other thing I want to say. This is the book. 
Um, I'm, I don't have any, I wouldn't, I'm not here to sell the copy of the book. Anyway, well I am. <laughs> Seventeen dollars and how much on Amazon.com? I think Sally, anyway, it's, it's less than 18, it's pretty cheap. Uh, Sam might be pressed into the paper with that. And I'll just conclude by saying I think there's so, so, so many reasons for us to be promoting walking and cycling. It's a good thing to do. Yes, it is a good thing, as Martha Stewart would have said. Um, that you have economic benefits, you have health benefits, you have uh, environmental benefits, a whole range of benefits. And that there are so many trips, as I mentioned way earlier in the presentation, was it over a quarter of our trips are a mile or shorter, 41% or two miles or shorter. So, so many of our trips are of a distance we could walk or bike. But we need to provide the conditions, whether it's sidewalks or cycle tracks or bike paths or intersections or whatever it might be that make walking and cycling safe and, and comfortable and convenient and feasible uh, on an everyday basis, not just for recreational uses, but really on an everyday basis to achieve practical purposes, whether it's shopping, getting to school, getting to work, whatever it might be. And I will stop there. <laughs> Have I outraged you enough? <laughs> As you can tell, I'm not opinionated at all. <laughs> Why don't we open up for questions? Yes? I don't know if you've had um, a significant amount of time to look at the um, current draft of the Seattle Bicycle Master Plan, um, but did you have enough of a chance to look at to, to see any room for improvement? You know, I looked at it so briefly that I don't really quite feel qualified to comment on it. Uh, I, can, I looked at the beginning part of it, and I just passed it up for some of but I did read it. And I really like that goal of making cycling possible, convenient, safe for all ages and all abilities. So I really agree with that. And, and noting that you really need a range of facilities. You can't just provide cycle track. It's just not feasible. Um, there's going to be certain arterials where you can't make that arterial into a neighborhood group. But you don't have to. It's, it's, it's using a range of types of facilities and a range of treatments depending on the specific context. My, my sense is looking at the plan, we may have took two hours to look at it. It's going in the right direction, but I feel I'd be <laughs> treading on thin eyes making specific comments on any particular. I know that there are some important missing gaps in the overall network here in Seattle, and I'm going to discover those missing gaps tomorrow because I have a guided bike tour <laughs> um, with the city administration engineer. And we're going to look at some of those missing gaps. So I'll find out about those, see them in person tomorrow. But overall, I think the plan looks pretty good. Uh, and it's going in the right direction. I think the key thing is lots of, we have, there's a really good plan on paper. Now let's implement it. I think one of the problems with Seattle is that there's too much time that's taken to get these things on the ground that we have all of these very ambitious plans and do this and that and the other and these, oh, it takes forever. I mean, I know process in Seattle is notoriously <laughs> important, but it seems to be taking decades to get things done, which can be done actually in a much shorter period of time uh, than it's taking here. So one is somehow it is, is how can I put it, generating that public support and political support that will then really get things implemented. Because it's, it's not like a secret what needs to be done. I think the, the real challenge is getting things implemented and getting politicians behind it and having the courage to just do it. Okay, I'm sorry. John, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have any idea back in the 50s and 60s, why did the US go in that same direction that, that Europe did? What was different about our culture or our geography or our cities that we didn't make that break? In the 70s. In the 70s, when the break 50s, was. 60s, whatever that well, was. I think, number one, there was a big difference in terms of in Europe. Uh, they didn't have any oil, I mean, except for the North, uh, North Sea oil. So they were much more dependent. So the energy crisis, which was started in the early 1970s, and that was, came again in 1979 or so, um, that that had much more of an impact on European thinking about transportation. It's like, wow, you know, this is, we're, we're totally dependent on imported oil. In the United States, I mean, now we're importing over half of our oil but we have much more of our own oil than they have in Europe. But so in terms of dependence on oil, that was one issue. They also, I mean, in a way, Europe has less of every resource. I mean, they have, it's just more people on less land. So whether it's water, 
when, when I see the way Europeans use water, it's like, we waste so much water. I mean, they come up with the, the special flush toilet so that, um, I know this is a little bit delicate, but anyway, <laughs> there's two different buttons. And so there's one button for, well, number one, and another button for number two. <laughs> okay. Anyway, and it saves a lot of water. Why should we have, what, you know, 20 gallons of water or whatever to flush the toilet? So whether it's water or the land, the same thing with parking. Uh, Australia and New Zealand have two buttons, too. Yeah, they do. And Australia and, does. And they're just as oil dependent as, as Europe, and they didn't go that direction. They didn't. They didn't. It, it, um, although in Australia, in terms of water, <laughs> uh, as you know, it's the driest continent on Earth. And they had a, I was there, in fact, on sabbatical for a whole year. And let me tell you, every drop was, was saved. Um, but you're, I, I think there's, I don't know, I can't really, if you look at the, I think another development here that I haven't talked much about is the trends in per capita income and trends in car ownership. And I think if you look at Canada, the United States, and Australia, the per capita incomes after World War II were higher, and so their auto, auto ownership was also much higher than it was um, in, in Northern Europe. They, were, they had suffered much more from World War II than, than we did. I th think that made a big difference uh, as well. So, you know, I could speculate more, but that would be my answer. Uh, yes. Yes. So improving traffic education and driver's education is a great idea and there's a lot that needs to be done there. But how do you get those ideas and that knowledge out to all the adults who are years away from driver education and don't intend to take it again? Wow, is that a good question? <laughs> we discussed that very issue on the train ride coming back to Seattle. <laughs> and that is, for example, I took my, uh, I do have a license, but I got it in 1969. I've never had to retake the test. And you don't want to. And probably don't, I know if I probably fail it. No, I don't. But it's a, in, it's a real issue in, in that, I mean, even the signs that change over time, the meaning, they're, they're brand new signs we didn't have 30 or 40 years ago. What do they mean? Uh, they have now new pedestrian crossing signs that we didn't have before. And I think many people have, don't have a clue. What does this mean? Um, I, if you, in New Jersey, the other issue is the crosswalk. I mean, the, in New Jersey, this is probably better, I hope, it's better here in Seattle, but there was a study done in New Jersey. 80% of motorists do not stop for pedestrians and crosswalks. 80%, 80%. I'm sure it's true here. Uh, I mean, in California, it's a, they do a much better job. I mean, like you get on the, sometimes they'll even stop when you're just on the curb about to enter the crosswalk. But I think that, uh, I don't know exactly what the solution is. But for, I mean, one thing is at least, for those people getting new licenses, vastly improving driver training. And I think there ought to be some sort of a every 10 years that you have to retake at least the written portion of the take, maybe even every five years. I don't think that's so much to ask. I really don't. You have to renew your license, you should have to do it then. I think so. I really yeah. do. I mean, at different states, they'll renew it in different periods. So, for example, in New Jersey, you have to renew your license every three years. They just want the money. <laughs> Um, but it should be every, it, there should be some period, maybe every five years or every ten years, that you really do have to take a serious test. And you know, I have a lot, of, we have a big exchange program with uh, a number of European universities uh, at Rutgers, and they, they, get your, they get American licenses, because for whatever reason, there's some reason that they get them, and they think our tests are a joke. They said, it's unbelievable. I mean, there's a, a stop, that says, what does a stop sign mean? speed up, turn right, whatever. Or when it says eight feet clearance, does it mean this way or that way or diagonally? I mean, the, but really, our, I think that our driver training and testing is incredibly lax. And the other issue that goes along with this is enforcement. I mean, for example, the issue of, of the reason that 80% of New Jersey motorists don't stop at crosswalks, I don't think it's so much as because they don't know they're not supposed to, it's just because it's not enforced. And if they thought they were going to get a big ticket every time that they didn't stop for a pedestrian crosswalk, they would stop. And so a lot of it's enforcement and the police just say they don't have the time to do it. Yes? Well, I would say I, I think economic incentive is the answer on that question. Uh, I just did the AARP course because it was discounted and Washington State uh, wa does give a discount, makes the insurance companies give you a discount on your insurance. I had an Arizona driver's license, I moved here from Arizona. Arizona doesn't 
get, require that discount. So my same insurance company would not give me the discount in Arizona, not until I got a Washington license would I get that discount. So I think economic incentives are the, are the answers. You are there. a genius. I want everyone to just listen to this once more. Isn't that a great idea? I mean, even if, this, even if, this, if the state doesn't require it by law, give this economic incentive. Require, let's just say, a 20% discount or a 30, whatever it is, some percentage discount over what you would normally pay for car insurance, which everyone has to have, if you take this course. I think that's a great idea. Let's, I want to hear a round of applause for that idea. I mean, I really think that's a great idea. And it's got to be, I mean, the cost of the course has to not offset the discount. Well, I think the courses should be offered for free. I really right, do. Right now, yeah, there is a cost. And, I, and just, just for your reference, I just came back from a trip to New York and New Jersey. And driving in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, I was amazed how bad the drivers were. They were the absolute most aggressive drivers that I've ever seen in my whole life. Whether it's California, Arizona, Washington, D.C., they were unbelievable in New Jersey. A then to that. If you knew <laughs> what I have been through, I have lived 37 years in New Jersey, and it's a wonder that I've lived to tell about it. Yeah. I mean, it is just outrageous. I have actually, this is really honestly going to say, I was once crossing the, I was crossing with the light. I wait, I waited, I wanted to get the full phase for walking. So I wait till I get the light, uh, the walk light. Someone was making, a motor was making a left hand turn, but was making it before the oncoming traffic could come. I mean, really was supposed to wait. But so that motor was looking at the oncoming traffic, not at the pedestrian in the crosswalk. So almost ran me down. I was so angry, I threw my umbrella at the car. He, he rolled down the window and he said, I'll get you next time. <laughs> I mean, that's the New Jersey motorist. I mean, you have no idea. Now, one of the reasons that New Jersey, part of it's the culture, but also it has, New Jersey has the densest traffic of any state in the United States. That is, if you look at the amount of traffic divided by the actual capacity of the roadways, so they have a lot of traffic for the state as a whole. But I mean, that doesn't excuse anything, but I mean, the, the impatience, the ag aggressiveness, the outright nastiness, I mean, people have just yelled things that are unrepeatable in this room. I mean, it's just incredible. Anyway, <laughs> sorry if anyone's from New Jersey, but okay, yes. I think it's absolutely crucial to convince the business community that they're going to benefit from this as well. And that's why I'm so glad I had this sort of a test run in, in Texas. Uh, because believe me, that was not a progressive crowd I was talking to in the state. I had to give a talk to the state legislature. I mean, not just the people in Austin. I mean, that's pretty progressive. But I mean, these are people from every corner of Texas. And they wanted to hear about profits. And so, but there's lots of, in the, the, not, not in this book, but in the, our benchmark report for the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control, um, we have a whole chapter on economic benefits. And, and for example, uh, in New York City, they did a study and they actually measured the, uh, looking at the sales tax revenues in the businesses along the cycle track, and they compared that to the, what the, the trending in sales tax revenues, so sales, uh, in the other, on the other streets, and it was like, I think it was 70%, 74% increase in the retail sales along the cycle track avenues and a much, much, much smaller increase in the sales tax revenues uh, on the other avenues. So I mean, that's, there's a lot of different sort of indices you can use. There was, um, I showed specific examples in Texas when I was in Texas because they wanted to see things in Texas. <laughs> they were an interest, they, they think that this is like communist country, of the communist corner of North America, they said, don't show examples from Cascadia. <laughs> they said, that's like not part of the United States. <laughs> they said, we want to see examples from Texas and Oklahoma and Arkansas and Louisiana. So I tried to do that. 
But anyway, there was a, I found an example of Fort Worth, Texas. They put in a bike lane, they enhanced the bike parking, and what they found is they really did measure, there's like a downtown improvement zone, they measured the increase in retail sales, and it was something like, I don't know what it was, a 55 or 65% increase in retail sales. So I showed that example. And so I think if you can find specific examples and say, you know, again and again and again, we have a whole chapter that summarizes examples you can give of how, in fact, improving bicycling facilities is going to actually uh, generate economic profits and increase sales tax revenues and so forth and so on. The other issue is regional competitiveness. I mean, here you are in Seattle, you've got this firm, uh, sort of a small firm called Microsoft. <laughs> I think people have heard about this firm. Uh, but you, know, you have a, sort of a high tech, a big, sort of fairly high tech concentration here. And you see, likewise with Portland and Vancouver and so forth, a lot of people value the quality of life and part of the quality of life is being able to walk and cycle and having a livable environment. Um, and I can tell you now, I mean, you're going to be competing with people in Austin, Texas. Um, they, there's a big high tech industry there as well. Uh, they've got Dell and various other things, and you know, they're building cycle tracks. They've already got three cycle tracks. You only have one! <laughs> I mean, they're, they're doing all sorts of things left and right, and they want to take away your jobs. They, they want to take away your population. And Chicago, the mayor of Chicago actually issued a challenge to Cascadia here and said, well, we're going to build over, he, he spent a commitment to build over 100 miles of cycle tracks in Chicago. And he says, we're going, to be, we're going to take away those high-tech jobs and bring them to Chicago. So even on a regional competitive basis, I mean, people who are, sort of have high-tech jobs and a lot of very well-educated, very well-qualified people are going to be attracted to, these, to the areas that have really good walking and cycling facilities. And so even on a regional basis of competitiveness, I think you can make an economic argument providing these cycling facilities. So threat, threat, threaten Seattle with Austin and Chicago. Yes. Um, back to the issue, I, I walk everywhere. Yeah. But I keep finding these boards that block the sidewalk. I call them sandwich boards, A-frames, whatever you want to call them. That are businesses putting, for some reason, they think they need a market and block the sidewalk. And I try to move them or deal with them. And they know, I got to have it here. And this is, it just, and it's all over the city. I, I can't find a street that doesn't have this problem. The other issue is the the width of the sidewalk and also the actual trees. Um, and the people just don't take responsibility. Whose property, whoever is it, if it's business, the city, whoever, don't realize that these things need to be taken care of. I mean, there's so much overgrowth. I'm great, I'm really, in, you know, like to see trees and all this stuff, but nobody takes care of them. Nobody cuts them. And so I have to hit my head on them or trip, trip on the sidewalk because of them. Well, I agree 1,000%. I am sick and tired of having cluttered up sidewalks. And I mean, the, the, I, there's, there are places on sidewalks, I'm, it's not that I'm against sidewalk cafes, but sometimes in New Brunswick, anyway, they take up 90% of the sidewalk. Well, where am I supposed to walk? They had like planters, and again, I'm not against planters, but they was taking up half of the sidewalk. Uh, or you have then the, sometimes if you have a poorly designed bike shelter, uh, uh, bus shelter, I mean, again, it's like it's taking up over half the sidewalk. And then putting these, these things, for these sort of, and the advertising out on the sidewalks, I mean, it really is bad. And, like, and just what you've said to When it's here, totally in violent of the law, but nobody's doing anything about it. And if I try to question anybody about it, they're like, well, I don't know. Or that's a regional, the regional office deals with that. And I have to spend my time on hold to talk to somebody when that manager should take care of it, but yeah. they're not going to. I agree. I mean, the, the, I, I personally believe there should be someone in the city department of transportation or the engineering department, whatever they call it, that is responsible, in fact, for making sure that these walking environments are, I'm not sure what to call clutter-free, um, so that people can easily negotiate these things. And uh, there, I mean, there are laws that we, there is a federal law the Americans with Disabilities Act, yep. and it requires localities and states to adhere to this law. But do you think they do? No. I mean, I have complained so many times, and you know, I, that about this, that, or the other obstacle. I think I can get going on this, but I, I'm so in agreement with you. I'm really enthusiastic so, about. So, what is Europe doing? Are they doing anything better? What, how is? Oh, I, you can't. I, they, they wouldn't have. They would have wider sidewalks. And I don't think they would they would allow that sort of clutter. I'm not saying so they have more any, enforcement or funding. You, you cannot just put up a sign 
this much more enforcement, whether it's in terms of guaranteeing the safety and the permeability, whatever, of this walking environment, the cycling environment, things are much, much, much more enforced. Certainly in Northern Europe, I, I'm not sure about Southern Europe, but going to say Denmark or Germany or Scandinavia, you find really very, very strict police enforcement of all of these things, and you can't just do whatever you want to do. Uh, and there really are certain standards that people uh, are, are, are held to. Yes? Uh, John, that said, having spent a little time in Copenhagen recently, um, advertising signs in front of businesses on the streets, fortunately integrated into temporary bike racks that they would send out front, um, was absolutely rampant. And I think the fundamental difference is, is one, more generous sidewalks, but um, two, the, the fact that the um, things that invade sidewalks, at least in Seattle, if not in the U.S., that there is no rhyme nor reason to them. That you'll end up with, with light poles popping out on this side and signs popping out on that side, and there is no clear pathway for the, the pedestrian. But I don't think that um, the street furnishings or signage or, or any of that is, is in any way unique uh, to Seattle or, or to the, the U.S. Well, I can't speak to Seattle because I, I haven't been here long enough. <laughs> um, but I can say that in New Jersey, it, it's really worse than what I've experienced in Europe at any rate, because we have overall narrower sidewalks, um, so that any clutter that does exist means there's less room overall to walk. And I find it a really big problem. The business needs to figure out how to make their building look better or paint or do something, but not put a flipping sign in the public right away. Yeah. Yeah. And it should be $5,000 if it's there. I mean, yeah. it's, I'm sorry, but it's... Yeah, I think there, there should be a fine that's enforced. It should be enforced and it should be a high fine. Other, yes, I'm sorry. Can you share any experiences you have with more suburban settings and areas um, that don't have a downtown core and are just kind of that low density strip malls next to um, low density urban or uh, suburban developments? That is really the issue of urban design and land use issues. And I can tell you, New Jersey, uh, I mean, believe me, it's sprawl. I mean, you know, we're, we're high, high density. We're the highest density state in the United States. But we've got sprawl. Um, but I think the issue is we do have a lot of train stations. Uh, and I think you can at least, maybe within a two mile radius of a suburban train station, you can try to form a core. And I think, I think the issue is focusing resources in terms of walking and cycling facilities on those areas where you think it can make a difference. Uh, starting there at least. And I think that's going to be around transit stops. I mean, it's in the suburbs I'm talking about now. That, where you have the sort of a sprawl, to the extent that you have transit, at least make it walk walkable to get to the transit stops. I have examples in New Jersey. There's no sidewalk, and you'll find a transit, a bus stop, like on the side of the road, and no way to get there. <laughs> it's like, good luck. Um, and so I think at the very least, you can, you can try to retrofit some of the suburbs so that they're more walkable. It means that we have no sidewalks at all. Uh, on many of our suburban streets, I think is a real problem. No, no crosswalks and so forth and so on, let alone cycling facilities. Um, the other issue, though, is to the extent that you can get a, any sort of a small community, uh, that in a small community, I mean, we have a lot of suburbs, uh, that, you can, that some of those shifts are going to be short. I mean, maybe it's a mile, maybe it's a half a mile. You're not going to necessarily be able to commute to work, but you can visit a friend, if you can have any sort of a shopping facility nearby, or maybe have a school nearby, if you have really a safe route to get to school. So it's a challenge. There's no question. It's, it's a challenge in the suburbs. But you know, in, I didn't, sh well, actually, that one of those shots that I showed was a new suburb, a new suburban development in Germany. And it, it was very walkable and very bikeable, and it, it wasn't very far at all to the nearest transit stop. And it wasn't by accident. I mean, there was, they really planned it that way to be walking and bicycling friendly. And, and not to have it sort of centered uh, around the car. So it, 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 there's no question, I'll tell you this, in virtually every city that I've looked at in the entire world, levels of cycling and walking are much higher in the center, and they go down, down, down as you go out. I mean, even Münster, Germany, where I lived for two and a half years, um, I mean, it has 40% of all trips by bike in the city of Münster, and as you go out, 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 it gets less and less and less and less and less, uh, except around the train stations. And there, actually, it's pretty high still. Yes? Uh, your last observation is clearly caused by higher property values. 
is more expensive to park cars and where land value is higher. Um, why do you suppose, I, I will assert that there's greater tax aversion in our country than in Europe. Why do you suppose that is? All three levels of government in America, the national government, the state government, and local government, suffer from great tax aversion. It's not so much that Seattle suffers from too much process as to why the bicycle is less demands, but plans are not implemented. It's a lack of money. Yep. Um, I don't think that's the only, I mean, we'll get to the money. I mean, yeah. the money is key. I mean, you have to generate the funding to build these facilities. But I would say that if you looked at the percentage, I haven't seen the exact percentages, but if you look at the percentage of the overall budget of most departments of transportation, usually a very small percentage is devoted to walking and cycling. At the federal level, I believe it's 1% or 2%. So you have 12% to 13%, I think 12.5% of all trips in the United States are made by walking or cycling, uh, and yet they get only 1% of federal funds. Um, so it's not just a matter of, okay, how do, we raise, how do we raise these funds for transportation? It's a matter of how do we spend the transportation funds we've got. And I think uh, if you look at how much more expensive it is to build a road than it is to build a better sidewalk or a better cycling facility or, or making a, a neighborhood greenway, the refraction of the cost of building a roadway. I think you are right. We do have this aversion to taxation. We have this uh, notion that, oh, money that goes to the government is going to be wasted somehow. We're not getting our money's worth, and so we want to keep taxes as low as possible. Um, but I don't think, I mean, funding is an issue, but I think the funding is mainly of well, what's going to get priorities. This, this happens in New Jersey as well. Uh, for example, and, and I just force them to change this. <laughs> I mean, not that I'm that powerful, but even when it comes to shoveling, it's like, what gets shoveled first? It doesn't snow here in Seattle, I guess. But in New Jersey, it snows, what, two or three feet a year? And it's like, normally, I mean, always, they shovel the, the, the roadway. And maybe four days, five days later, a week later, they might shovel the sidewalks. No. And it's a matter of priorities. And, and it's just that the motorists have the say. They get the bigger chunk of the pie. And so I think that's actually a, a lot of what's going on here. But I think the other issue is it is true. Taxation levels are high, even in Canada. The, the overall taxation level is higher in Canada than it is in the United States, and it certainly is much higher in, in Europe. Um, and, but what they're getting, I think one of the reasons that Europeans are, are willing to pay, and are used to paying, higher taxes is they figure they're getting free, free university education, there's universal health care, um, and they're getting a, a superb level of public transportation, I mean, well integrated, I mean, rail, bus, nice conditions and so forth. And I think that many Americans sort of look at the money that we're putting into transportation and it's like, well, you know, that, that, that wasn't very well built or, you know, this wasn't very well built and so forth. There's a lot of disappointment in the way that many government expenditures are made. I think because of that disillusionment that there's then less willingness to say, well, if they're not going to spend it intelligently, let's just not pay taxes at all. So there's, I don't know how you overcome the American aversion to taxation. But it exists. I mean, it's just you propose raising the gasoline tax by five cents, and you're voted out of office. I mean, that it's that sort of an aversion. Whereas, in, in, if you look at, at, at um, Western Europe, I mean, almost all of the increase pr gasoline prices are about three times higher, two to three times higher, depending on the country, than they are here in the United States. All the difference is due to taxation. It, it's not because the price of petroleum is higher for Europeans. They put on humongous taxes. They put on high taxes on auto ownership. So in, in Denmark, you pay a 168% sales tax when you buy a new car. That's a pretty big deterrent to buying a new car. Um, but you know, they, they then dedicated the, those proceeds of all of these. Uh, it, in fact, the, the taxation on auto ownership and use in Germany, for example, is four times higher than roadway expenditures. And they use the net, so a huge surplus. And they use the surplus to finance education and health care and transit and walking and cycling facilities. So at least they feel they're getting something in return. And I think Ameri many Americans feel that the government's not giving them what they want in return. I, I, I don't have a real, real answer to your question, but that's, that's my feeling on it. Yes? Um, so I, I keep coming back to this issue of the role of education mm -hmm. in fostering really vibrant cycling communities. Yeah. And, I mean, there's no question that we need to have better infrastructure, but you can't necessarily assume that you build it and people will ride on it. That there's, if you think about it in terms of like capacity building, there's the, you know, like removing impediments and creating good infrastructure, but then there's this other piece of it that has to do with 
educating people about like how to cycle and the rules of the road and, and sort of fostering and encouraging. And so I'm just I'm just wondering like you know for cities that do cycling really well in Northern Europe and in Latin America, what sort of role education has played? It's a big role. I mean, it's a big role. Um, and, and I mentioned this was before me by, by the third and fourth grade. They had extensive education in safe walking and cycling. And they're just used to doing it. And, and you know, it's a sort of a, a self reinforcing, it's a virtuous circle because that's the way they get to school. They're not being chauffeured to school. And so it's crucial. I mean, the, the schools really don't have any choice but to give us education because that's the way the kids are going to get to school. They're not allowed actually to walk or bike to school until they have this education in third or fourth grade. Then they can walk and bike to school because they felt that like they need to have this training and say, walking and bicycle. Um, but the, one of the things that I, I guess I really didn't mention enough, and that is you really need an integrated package of complementary policies. It, I mean, it's great to have infrastructure, and it's sort of a, maybe even a prerequisite to have safe infrastructure, but it's by no means sufficient. You really have to have a whole range of other programs, educational programs, training programs, uh, promotional programs, car free days, bike to work, uh, bike to school, walk to work, and so forth and so on. There's so many things you can do, these open streets programs, uh, to promote education and promotional programs. We did, I did a survey with Jennifer Gill and Susan Handy. Um, it was financed by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And it was exactly looking at this, what, looking at each specific program, we found that looking at each individual program or each kind of infrastructure, if it was a cycle track or a bike lane or kind of a common, whatever it was, it, it was hard to measure the impact because it was the overall package that really made a difference. And one of the things that really impressed me is in Portland, Roger Geller is the bike planner for Portland, and uh, one of the articles in 2008, we did this article called Making Cycling Irresistible. And we took uh, six case study cities. And we showed how each of these cities did this, 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 this. And there were category by category that did all these things. And then what Roger did is he added Portland as a seventh column. And he said, see, we're also doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So really, Portland is also, they have a whole video they put out. They do the, the training, the education, the promotion. And they have training programs for seniors, for kids, for all age groups, all sorts of abilities. Uh, they have the infrastructure provision. They have the world's largest naked bike ride, for those people who get turned on by that. And so, but it really, I think, the, I think education is an absolute key here, um, because it gets you used to the idea of walking and cycling, and also makes sure that, that you know how to do so safely. But I also think, getting back to education, getting back to motorist, uh, we, we lost each other. <laughs> getting back to motorist training, I mean, that, I think, is even at least as important as, yeah. as, as educating the, the cyclists and the pedestrians. Because I could be the most educated cyclist or pedestrian in the world, but it just takes a motorist doing something really stupid or illegal, and I'm dead. Yeah. And that, that's why I think it's so crucial not just to, to, to give them the education, but also to enforce it with, I mean, really uniformly enforce it and have very high fines. Let me give you an example of this, which I'm very much in favor of, like speed cameras. In, in Germany, they're all over the place. In, in many cities, they say, oh, this invasion of our rights, civil liberties, or whatever, is ridiculous. Well, I was once in a car with two German friends. I was not driving the car, but I was sitting in the right seat. And we were driving through a town, and all of a sudden, um, the driver of the car was German and said, uh oh, it would give us. And we weren't, we weren't traveling that fast, but he saw immediately the slashing light. And he showed me in the mail, in fact, I have a PDF of what he got in the mail. Here's a picture. My face was blotted out. They always show the driver's face. They show your face in your car, and they'll tell you exactly the speed you were going, uh, what the speed limit was, and because you were that many miles or kilometers over the speed limit, you get this fine, and there's just no recourse. I mean, you, you're going to pay. I mean, your license plate is on it. It's recorded with how fast you're going and so forth. I mean, that sort of enforcement, I mean, is maybe necessary, I think, in the United States. In, in New Jersey, another... <laughs> The infamous, the, the, our, our New Jersey uh, experience, uh, uh, expert here, uh, is not around us to hear about this, but um, I would say when the light turns red, I mean, it's almost it's really terrible in New Jersey. You cannot assume that those cars are going to stop. For maybe a second or two seconds or three seconds, they continue going through the red light. Jeez. Which means when you see walk, you don't want to just walk. I mean, you look to your left to make sure. 
there's not a car. That's how bad it is. And, but it is, I mean, it's just, it's a matter of, I, I just think that better educating voters and also getting to this issue of uh, every five years or every 10 years requiring a retesting of voters to be sure that they're physically able, uh, but also that they understand the rules, that there are new signs that come up and so forth. Well, you got a handful for that answer to that question, didn't you? <laughs> yes. Um, when are Cycling yesterday, we must have noted about 20 or 30 times. Boy, is this a crappy road! It's awful. I mean, really uneven surfaces, potholes. I mean, really dangerous in some cases. I mean, just just the road itself. I'm thinking, for example, some of these the otherwise road would be perfect neighborhood greenway, but I mean, whether it's for the cars or for the cyclists. It would be nice to have some roads that didn't have potholes that were a foot deep. Right. I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, same with the sidewalk, the same problem. The same, they certainly They're horrible. They're unacceptable. And they have to so be Do you know if Seattle has a plan for that in their bike plan? I can't tell you. I can't tell you. But you, you, to me, that is so it's important. It's not going to work if really you don't is. have a reasonable surface to bike on. Yeah. Yeah. Period. Yeah. I mean, what happened is an example of this for where I mean, my home tent. Sort of hometown, the right north of the New Jersey Island Park. They had to redo the water lines and the sewer lines and so forth. But they, they never really repaint them. They just sort of, it's a little patch up here and a little patch up there. And sometimes it's a hole, like a rectangle, that's two inches below the, 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 the rest of the street. And it doesn't take much. I know people who fall on their bikes as a result of that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, and I know people who get serious, I mean, really can lead to serious injuries. And of course, the faster you're going, the more likely it's going to be a serious injury. So I think that actually is a very, making the roads really in good condition is, is, I think, also a prerequisite. Yeah. If I could and add to that. by the way, the sidewalks, I think it's absolutely crucial. I have seen sidewalks, really uneven sidewalks. And in, I, I teach a, a, a seminar at Rutgers uh, every fall on pedestrian cycling planning. And one of the sessions we do, everyone has to get into a wheelchair and navigate the sidewalk. You wouldn't believe it. I mean. Yeah, some of our students, men with muscles like this, had trouble. I mean, they, they couldn't manage the wheelchair. And the other with these very uneven sidewalks or gaps in the sidewalk. And, like, and then at the corners, they would be uneven. You almost tip over. I mean, it's like, I really think that people who design these things ought to have to use them right. as and a person in a wheelchair yeah. or yeah. a person you know, who has sight impaired and to, and to experience what it's like yeah. if you have that sort of a disability and I, you need that special... Uh, yeah, I take about 30 buses a week and I do a, a lot of bike bus and I know every parking pothole in downtown Seattle <laughs> more than I would like to. Yeah. Actually, John? Um, yep. Well, I certainly can't answer this citywide. I don't work for the city, but I am involved with Ballard Greenways, so one of our local neighborhood mm -hmm. Greenways groups. And right now, the city is in the process of installing a green, converting Northwest 58th Street into a greenway. One of the things that they are doing is some not replacing the sidewalks, but they're doing a lot of grinding of the uneven surfaces and the the gaps that are in there to smooth that out. Mm -hmm. They have put in curb ramps at some, the where it crosses the arterials. So it's not every corner, unfortunately, but it is at some of the high, most highly trafficked ones. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the, the bike ped program is partnering with the like road repair program to replace some of the broken concrete panels. So it's not as much as is needed, but it's a very good start. And it is really very encouraging to see the bike ped program actually partnering with other parts of the Department of Transportation and other city programs to, to work together and mm -hmm. to leverage these funds. Mm -hmm. So I think it is an improvement and a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I guess the, to go back to one of earlier points, 
it can't be done fast enough. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's there, in, in a matter of priorities, I mean, there are people every day whose lives are in danger yes. because of, of these kinds of surfaces, these potholes. I mean, I know people, uh, one of my friends in New York, who was bicycling and he hit a pothole and he almost died. I mean, he had a brain injury and he almost died. These are really serious issues and, you know, they really need to be dealt with as soon as possible. These, I mean, they're, before you build a new road, how about fixing up the ones we've got? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, on the east side, east of the lake here, one common thing that you see happen again and again is there'll be a 35 mile an hour road, which is over the speed where fatalities start to happen. And they'll paint a white line down each side of the road and say, we've just created bike lanes. We've made this safe for biking. And I look at that and, and I wonder, I know there are better approaches, like moving it to a 25 mile an hour lane that's parallel or street that's parallel to it, or possibly shifting the whole road over and turning this into uh, a, a separate bikeway. But um, what I keep hearing from the planners is, oh, you don't want to do the the separate bikeway thing because people are used to looking one way for all traffic and the other way for all traffic. And if you have bike traffic that's coming a different way than the rest of the traffic, it will confuse people and will have more accidents. And I wanted to know an expert perspective of what is the best approach for that pro common problem. I'd have to really see the specific road to really, I can tell you that this comes up in terms of narrow, narrow roadways. And how do you deal with it in terms of accommodating pedestrians and cyclists? I can tell you that very many cases in the Netherlands, in Germany, and Denmark, that you turn this into a, it's not a car-free street, but it's called the bicycle street. But it's where, I mean, there's, there's sidewalks too, of course, but the, it, it's a street where they reduce the speed limit to walking speed or whatever it is, and then on top of that, they, they allow cars on it, but they're not allowed to rush or honk their horns at the pedestrians or the cyclists. And so, it, in a way, it's a shared space with priority for pedestrians and for cyclists. Um, basically, that, what I'm saying is that where the road is that narrow, they say, okay, this road is really, if we're gonna make it safe for pedestrians and cyclists, it's too narrow, really, to also allow roads, uh, cars on there. Or if they do, they'll make it just one way, just one lane in one direction. Okay. Yeah, this isn't really a narrowness issue. It's actually oh. the opposite. Oh. Make it safe for bikes with paint, and they, they turn it into a nice wide bike lane that also has cars in it and the trash every Monday. Um, and and you know, you're zooming from that into a 35 mile an hour double lane road. Um, so they've, they've looked at it and they've said, we've made this thoroughfare safe for biking. And I question whether it is safer. I know that there are better ways to do it, but I'm wondering what the best way is. Okay, I'm not, I'm not an engineer. Okay. <laughs> so I can't really give you a professional answer. I mean, there are actually transportation engineers who specialize in pedestrian cycling facilities who can tell you all the different standards, the inch by inch, millimeter by millimeter, or whatever. Um, Speak, you know, you don't have a planning strip of any sorts. Yeah. If you fall off that sidewalk, you're going to be hit. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> I think yes. what you're describing is um, the typical thing that we see versus what you're seeing these are bi-directional cycle tracks. So, because you were asking, you were talking about a bi right. well, my, cycle track. My, my point is a two-inch strip of paint doesn't protect bicyclists from 35 mile per hour cars. Yep. With what the feedback you were getting from the planners was a bi-directional cycle track is confusing to people. Yes. So you were asking him. Yes. If oh, I, so your, so your, your question is how, how dangerous are the bi-directional cycle tracks? Is, is, that, it, is that correct? That those are more dangerous no. than no. protecting no. people? No, 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 no. It's, it's, not. Not. it's not. Because if you look, I mean, it takes some getting used to it, but if, if you look at the bi-directional cycle tracks, for example, they have you See them in Vancouver, you have them over 100 kilometers in Montreal. But, but, and this is the big but, you have to have a very, very good intersection design. The right markings, the right signage, the right traffic lights, and so forth, because 
if you have, whether it's a cycle track or a bi, whether it's one directional or bi directional, it's at the intersection that you need really, really, really careful treatments. Because from the bi directional cycle track, it can be very confusing making certain kinds of turns depending on what side of the road it's on. Um, and, and even if it's a one directional cycle track, it's it's a special challenge with cycle track. The reason is that on a cycle track, you're sort of for a while out of the line of sight of the motorist. And then all of a sudden at the intersection, there you are. And so you have to have a special provision. But the Dutch have worked on this for decades and perfected it. And there are, if you go to streets, one of the streets, street films, street films and a number of other places as well. There are lots of videos that show exactly how the Dutch have dealt now with this intersection issue. So that whether it's a bi-directional cycle track or a one-directional cycle track or whatever it is, you can deal with the intersection issue. But our problem in New Jersey, I can only say, is there are idiots who sometimes design these facilities. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that in Washington State, they're, they're more intelligent than in New Jersey. But sometimes as a cyclist and as a pedestrian, I'm saying, who in the World. In fact, I, I, I actually I had to get the keynote address of the Ted Bike Summit um, uh, three years, four years ago in New Jersey. And I knew people from New Jersey to get to a good either. And boy, did I embarrass them. But they had, they, I mean, they had a crosswalk that was so dangerous that they, they changed an off ramp to a major highway that goes right into where the crosswalk is with no advance warning, and they widened the radius so, so those cars would go faster, making it more dangerous. The issue is that traffic engineers are the ones who end up building these things. Right. And unless they are pedestrians and cyclists, I don't think they really understand the needs of pedestrians and cyclists. And in the Netherlands, every traffic engineer is a cyclist and a pedestrian as well. And so they're much more aware of these needs, and they're not going to design a facility that's really stupid. But I, all I can say is I have seen really stupid facility design, both for cycling and for walking. And I think it's just because of the fact that many of these traffic engineers never get outside their cars, and they, they haven't a clue. Okay, John, yes. can, I, can I just really quickly say we're really lucky to be joined on our Vancouver trip by the city of Kirkland's traffic engineer. So that would be a good person to start yeah. with. Can, can on, we, on your, David yeah. Godfrey from the city of Kirkland. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add something? Because you said you think that they're not cyclists, and that's part of the problem. I actually think part of the problem is that a lot of them are cyclists, but they're, they're the cyclists that are fine riding in traffic. They're, they're fine with a four-inch strip of paint, and so they think they have created a safe cycling facility. Um, I, I think we need more, you know, women and you know pe just people who are who are like you you said you wouldn't you know i wouldn't walk that i wouldn't i wouldn't bike that um that's what we need for cycling you know let me tell you what the real problem is that is there are federal standards from a uh, there's ashto which is the american association of state highway and transfers officials um and they have this uniform thing of, of signal devices and so forth and most states and most cities will adhere to these federal standards those federal standards are way out of date, yep. and they were developed by traffic engineers who, uh, to the extent that they were cyclists, believe in something, believe it or not, it's called vehicular cycling, which means riding your bike as if it were a motor vehicle, and simply having no facilities of any kind, not even a paid line, no facilities whatsoever for cyclists. And they have been the biggest hindrance to improving cycling facilities in the United States, because what they have influenced the engineering profession overall to it really takes uh, you can introduce something on an experimental basis um, and get approval from the federal government to do this, uh, but otherwise it doesn't conform to the ASHTO standards, it's sort of this green book or whatever they call it, and that's the real problem. I think it's uh, it's not so much the cyclists who want the bike lanes; it's the cyclists who don't want any facilities, the, who, the traffic engineers who don't want any facilities. Uh, and, uh, and, and whatever. Uh, it, you can sort of debate, you know, what's, what's the result of it, but I, I do think that, that in the United States, where most people get around by car, uh, and including, by the way, the police. Now, I've, I've many times, in crosswalks, been almost run over by police. 
And I went and filed complaints. I went to the police department and filed a complaint, and of course nothing happened. And it's like, well, if the police are going through, and there was even a signalized crosswalk with a red light, and I had the walk light. The, this is in New Brunswick. The policeman went through the red light. It was not a, an emergency or anything, because he stopped at the red light so I could catch up with him and write down the license number and the card number. And nothing happened, no consequences. So if the police are going through crosswalks and red lights, what do you expect the other motorists to do? So I, I think the real problem is that so many traffic engineers, policemen, judges, and so forth and so on, and really all of this stuff, are, are they're sort of looking at things through the windshield of a car. And that's a very different perspective than someone who is mainly walking or cycling on a daily basis. So that's just my opinion. Yes. Continuing on this kind of this theme, it really does seem like even when the traffic engineers and folks that we've worked with in SDOT are, even when they're well-intentioned and they seem to have the, the right goals in mind, they appear to have to go through this whole learning process all over again and reinvent the wheel. And we've seen that with some of the approaches, fortunately it's been abbreviated, but at least with some of the approaches to neighborhood greenways in Seattle where the first version of it is what Portland was doing in year one. And then this year we've managed to get them up to maybe year three or four. <laughs> and we're hoping next year we can get them maybe up to current standards. But I think the, the question and the concerns about uh, two-way cycle tracks from the fellow from Kirkland are that same kind of process that it seems like regardless of what has been done and developed in the Netherlands or in Denmark, a lot of the engineers here seem to have to go through that entire learning process without jumping to the end. Let me just also just add to something, defend the transportation engineering profession, <laughs> having just <laughs> scandalized one, um, that there is really a new generation coming on board. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there was sort of this old generation of traffic engineers and transportation planners, and we have a completely, really a new generation coming on board that is much more open-minded, that is much more aware of the needs of pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and that I really see much more awareness. I mean, I, uh, for example, I mean, the, the, I think the city engineer, uh, the traffic engineer here in Seattle, is really has very well intentioned. I think he's aware of all of these issues we're talking about now. But that's new. If you went back 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, traffic engineers were not at all concerned about the, really the needs of pedestrian and cyclists. I mean, not not to the extent that they are now. And now we're sort of really getting up there. And I think that's improvement. There's something to be happy about. To be uh, grateful for that even I'm not sure, even even the transportation engineering profession they've been seen as the main sort of obstacle to a lot of these kinds of policies that urban planners and urban designers want to implement but they find that they're being blocked by transportation planners you know, no 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 you have to have this standard or that standard because the cities in New Jersey are constantly fighting with New Jersey DOT I'm not sure how it is here in Washington state but often communities want to have their, their main street policies, they want to have complete streets, they want to slow down the speed limit, they want to change the, the put in speed tables at, at intersections, but if it's a state road, New Jersey DOT says no, you can't do it. And so there's this sort of an, an obstacle there, especially at the state level, that well, they're mainly building highways for the state as a whole, and they're not really city oriented. And I think that that's where the, these, these new, I'm sure you've heard about the NACTO standards, the National Association of City Transportation, has come up with you know, new sets of standards, both for pedestrians and for cyclists, that are much more sensitive to the needs within cities and local communities. And if my local community wants to slow down the traffic on a state roadway that's going through our community, and that's our main street, why shouldn't we be allowed to do that? And, and I've made, I'm on the traffic safety committee for our town. It's like we do just have constant fights with our DOTs. And I think the DOTs throughout the country, they're probably, maybe there's a few really progressive DOTs, but I find that the communities are actually usually more progressive and want to do more pro, pro by pro bit, pro pet things than uh, the, the state DOTs. They've been sort of a real obstacle to us. Why don't we end there? I'm tired. <laughs> you're, you're really tired. You've got to be tired of listening because I am talking. <laughs>